So how, how, would you, how would you say his name? Yeah, how would you? Steve? Okay, last name. <laughs> I don't know how do you say your last no, name. No, I want you to say oh, it. Oh, you got to say it and embarrass me and yourself. <laughs> 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 Try it. <laughs> I, don't to, I don't know how to say it. Say it. <laughs> to, to, not to offend you, I don't know your fucking last name. <laughs> All right, hold on. So, so, oh, hold, on. I'll spell, hold on, I'll spell it out for you. Yeah. Let's see. K- I'm forgetful, I- man. <laughs> R-K-E. Yep. G-A-R-D. R-D, yeah. G- Give him a little hint. It's Danish. So that, that'll that help It's him. of Danish origin? Absolutely, yeah. All right, there you go. It's going to be bad. Just say it, Steve. What? Steve Kierkegaard? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I've heard worse. <laughs> I've heard worse. It's actually just Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard, okay. Yeah. I was it's like, actually I kind of just throw a little, like it's spelled. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Kierkegaard, I like yeah. that one. A little uh, oh, that's funny. twang in there. Well, right. growing up as a kid, you'd hear everything. You'd go get your name called for something, and it'd be everything from. Krickenhofer to Kicking Bird <laughs> <laughs> to, to all kinds of different things. So yeah, but it's Kierkegaard just like it sounds. Yeah, yeah. I had I yeah. didn't I didn't know I, I didn't realize I was saying his well I didn't really say his name. No, but then you just you just told me right. how to say it. So it's like okay, cool. I think he just gave himself his new Indian name. Yeah, <laughs> Kicking <Kirk> Bird. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. Just yeah, yeah that's good. All right, I'll, you ready? Yeah, let's yeah. go. Right, my name is Sid Alinek. This is Marcus. We are joined tonight by the owner of Bullets Marjorie, new owner, Bullets Marjorie, Steve Kirkegaard. We're Perfect. talking about behind, behind the scenes of the funeral industry. You are listening to Fall Out Radio. So uh, how did how did you come to acquire Bullets Marjorie? Well, kind of a, a long story. I had a funeral home up in Lewistown, um, and I was my family, my wife and I specifically, were kind of looking to to kind of be closer back to this area by this area, kind of South Central Montana, mm-hmm. and uh, we had heard that you know, that the Bullis Mortuary was for sale for some time. But like any other industry, you get inside chatter and inside um, uh, rumors and things of that nature. And I was under the impression it was sold. Mm -hmm. And my dad, who at that time worked for a casket distributor in Billings, said, have you talked to Punky and Terry yet? And I said, well, no, because I'm under the impression it's been sold. And he says, no, you better do something so anyway i made a I made a phone call and got punky on the phone right away and said hey not to not to bother you or or be nosy or anything but you know is the mortuary for sale or will it be coming up for sale and she said oh yeah it's for sale and i think that was on a tuesday mm-hmm. um in july of 22 something like that and uh, we set a meeting up thursday we came down and uh Met with Punky and Terry, took a tour of the facility, kind of got a little bit of a feel for for what their operation was like. And the next six months or so was really kind of a a mutual courting process between both sides. <clears throat> they wanted to know they had the right person mm-hmm. or the right family. And uh, I th- I think that we fit the bill for them because... We're small town, both my wife and I are small town Montana people. I grew up in Circle. She grew up in Malta. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I had a lot of experience with different tribes in the state. I ran the funeral home in Wolf Point. I worked in, in Forsyth with the Cheyenne and then up in Malta some with uh, Grovan and the Assiniboine up there too. So that was kind of an added bonus coming here. So oddly enough, of all the tribes in the eastern part of the state, it was really just coming here that I got to, you know, got the opportunity to work with the Crow tribe and their culture. Mm-hmm. So, right. So how do you, I mean, you've been a part of this 
the industry for how long? I'm going on about 13 years now. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So how, like when you were just getting into like doing the, the funeral thing, mm -hmm. how does that, was it kind of like a, a different thing to see with different cultures and different Native American cultures and how it's kind of like different with the traditional funeral process? Yeah, it's, it's different. <clears throat> um, you know, even, even the tribes, you know, even if we were to, to put the tribal funeral culture side by side, there's nuance mm -hmm. in all of that. They're all like, for example, the Sioux do things just a little bit different than the Assiniboine do even. But um, if you go by reservation, like the Fort Peck Reservation, which is a Wolf Point yeah. poplar, um, and even the Cheyenne and the, and the Crow, let, let the Crow tribe, as far as funeral culture goes, the Cheyenne, or not, not all the time, nothing is set in stone, but they're more of a wake culture. I remember when I first came here, wake was such a word I was used to right. saying yeah. because yeah. we did so many of them. We'd, we'd take... So we take a loved one to the wake, a teepee, a home, something like that. Yeah. Well, when I first started here, I remember a, a, a lady was in and we were visiting and I said, now, where will the wake be to this crow lady? Yeah. And I got the <laughs> thousand yard stare and she said, crow don't do wakes. We do visitations. Yeah. And, and I didn't mean that in a wake sense, it was just a word that was synonymous to right. me, but it wasn't to her. And I was like, my apologies. I know it's visitation. Yeah. So, so. what's, yeah, uh, like they, they don't do that. What's the difference sense. between a wake and a visitation? I, it's just the word or is it, to be honest, it's, I don't know because it's every time they say that they're, they're having a visitation. I've been to a wake and a visitation. It's like, Similar, same. Literally, like the same. The only, the only thing I've, I've, noticed. I've noticed, like with Cheyenne um, specifically, is a lot of that ceremony they'll mm -hmm. do, the paint, the smudge, a lot mm -hmm. of that. They, it, they almost like to do that as a as an intimate cultural thing amongst a few. You know what yeah. I mean? There's a ceremonial man yeah. that handles most of that, as as there is here. Now, now recently. Um, as far as my experience, it's gone on for a long time, but it, it comes in ebbs and flows, um, like smudging of the casket. Right. That's just started to happen again. In fact, it happened the other day. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th th there are there are ebbs and flows with particular ceremonies that happen. You know, you know sometimes so, they kind of like go away for a little bit, then they kind of make a comeback. Make a comeback. <laughs> yeah. Yep, that's right. You know, what's yep. funny is uh, Steve. I think you'll recognize the culture. As uh, Steve was telling me a story that just just happened, like maybe a few months ago or so, mm -hmm. um, he was like, "What do you think this this culture is, or what Native Americans uh, this would have been?" Because the place was filled with smoke, and they were chanting. There was bells, and people you, people twirled at the caskets too, right? That sound familiar to you? <clears throat> they what with the casket? They like twirled in front of the casket when they walked by. That's striking a memory, or uh, it kind of does, but then it sound like something from Washington, like Shaker Church, like a and, Shaker Church, yeah, with the, <clears throat> the, the bells, bells and the chanting and stuff. Yeah, that does kind of sound like that. Yeah, yeah, he was telling me that, and I was like, that kind of sounds like the sh uh, Shakers up in Washington. Yeah, it was a very particular, and it happened in the building here, and they requested it very, mm -hmm. very nicely, very kindly, and. Terry was actually around that day, the former owner, you know, Terry was around and he said, I don't think I've ever in my close to 50 years or so have ever seen that yeah. ceremony in this building, a cedar bath yeah. and all of that too. It was very, very <clears throat> interesting and um, not something that you can really prepare for we had to literally be walked through it as to what was going to happen yeah. because it was like i've never yeah never seen that particular ceremony before it was very in-depth yeah because yeah. um i remember at grandpa's funeral in washington um one of our uncles went up there and he would twirl yeah and then it happened like every now and again people would come up and they would twirl yeah i remember that and i asked mom I was like what what is that why they why they twirl the casket and she said it's a shaker church and i never understood what a shaker was until like way later it's loud <laughs> yeah <laughs> it is it's well loud. when you you said the bells and the you know somebody said and i don't know that this is true so don't it, so like in the your, your plains culture here mm -hmm. we're kind of where we're at you're trying to get whatever may be bad away 
Yeah. You know, you're trying to get, you're trying to get all, all the bad spirits away and bad medicine mm -hmm. away. So someone can journey without that. This was different. Someone said they're actually, and not in a bad way, but they were trying actually praying to invite particular things in, yeah, rather than out. And so that that would be a very noticeable dichotomy in culture yeah, there right, if you yeah. saw that. You know, and I but, think that the, the the culture down there it's kind of like a mix between what would be like a, a church setting and with the Native American culture. Yeah, it's like they kind of intertwine. It's those. kind of blended. Yeah. 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 And um, I remember mom telling us a story of her being inside a Shaker church as a kid. Because my grandpa would travel everywhere and preach at these yeah. different places. And she was at one and she was, there was this lady that had her eyes covered and she was brushing out like a spirit, trying to get a, a bad spirit out. And she kept following mom. Like chasing her? Yeah, she, like, she felt like, like. <laughs> going to her and uh, grandpa kept going, get out of the way. <laughs> oh, get really? over here, yeah. And uh -huh. mom, mom would move and that lady would just turn to mom again and do that turn mom's like freaking out <laughs> like it's trying to follow her and she's right. trying to chase it away <laughs> yeah but it's i mean it especially i mean i work with you here at bullis mortuary i do like the marketing and stuff and the videos we see on facebook and i spend a lot of time around funerals and i think we grew, we've grown up that way too oh, is, yeah. if is our dad would always make sure we were around Funerals, comfortable with death and stuff, just in uh, case. Comfortable around the bodies too. Yeah. yeah, because his whole deal was like, I'm gonna go sometime, yeah. and I want you to be comfortable seeing me in that setting. Yeah, and he made sure that we were, and we did. We became comfortable with it, and it wasn't really like a weird thing. But mm -hmm. being around the mortuary, you kind of get a sense of how important death is in the culture. And it's it's something more prominent, right? In the and especially this part of the of Montana is this, it, death is a big part of the culture. So how do how do you see different changes? What with the traditional setting and the like the transition between like New Age funerals with Native Americans? Yeah. So a couple things, and you brought up or you hit on a really really good point about what. I find so um, impressive about, and, and I'll just speak specifically because we're here, but let's mm -hmm. say the Crow tribe specifically, and we can say the Cheyenne because they're right next door. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but th there's such a respect for the process of closure here. You know, acro across America right now, by and large, we're a death denying culture. People want to be as far away from it as they can. They mm -hmm. don't want to deal with it. You guys know that before I, I, I became involved with the funeral home here, I managed a big funeral home in Billings yeah. for, and you know, I can't tell you and, and nothing against those folks. I can't, I can't put myself in their shoes and how they make decisions or what's important to them and their family. But there's, there's such a, a, a line between modern culture in general and and what we get to deal with with the with the tribes because death viewing which um i'm i'm very i i think that's it's crucial myself that's why i'm in this business here is because you have to be able to separate your that physical person from this world mm -hmm. i mean that's your personal way to say this is the final physical separation and it allows you to say goodbye in a setting where you have a tremendous amount of support mm -hmm. you have uh an environment that's designed to grieve in and so on and so forth so what i worry about in other areas of the funeral industry as far as death goes is there's so many people now not here um, th there are people that I've never even had come into the office. If they had a loved one pass away, they'd call the funeral home. We'd pick up their loved one and take them into our care and get in contact with the family. And they were like, we want, we want a cremation. We don't want anything else. We've literally, I've literally done those cases and never met that family face to face. It's been done through email. Wow. It's been done through what it, phone, phone and email. They've never had any desire to see their loved one. And the saddest part is there are, are there are shelves all around the country 
mm-hmm. at mortuaries or crematories. And one that sticks with me, and I won't mention the funeral home itself, but there was a, an urn sitting on a shelf. And I just, I could tell from looking at it, it, ha- it was a much older uh, vessel. You know, it was an urn that was from, from days gone by. Anyway, mm-hmm. I go and uh, I look at the, the name on there. And then I look at the date, and it was it was like June twentieth of nineteen eighty four. Wow. wow! And I thought to myself, that was once a living, yeah. breathing person that lived a life of some sort. Maybe had a family, maybe didn't. Maybe had a job, maybe had friends, maybe had everything. And it was just sad to me to see that life relegated to a box about that big right. on a shelf, and no one ever came for it. You know yeah, what I mean? Wow. And so yeah. so when I say I respect the culture here, I mean, I can say that, uh, I, I can say that definitively without, it's it's done the way it should be. I mean, that, that process of goodbye is that important, I think. Right. Like, I can't, like, actually growing up in on the reservation and my dad being, like, so um, basically teaching us how important that is, I can't imagine that. Like, you know, can't imagine that or even... Um, having somebody just, you know, oh, go ahead and take care of that and whatever, you know, like almost like it's like not, 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 not a big deal because to us it's, it's been a huge deal. You know, it's always a huge deal. Like even my grandpa um, on my mom's side, he was like so well known. He had like three, four funerals. Yeah. Him. He had like three, he had a couple of funerals actually. He had one here. And in Crow. He had one in Crow. He had one in Billings and he had one in Washington. Wow. Wow. And the one in Washington was massive. Yeah, like it was. It was massive. Like I remember, um, there's still pictures of us taking to him to his final resting place, and we carried him that whole way from where we had the funeral. And there was just like you know the the street was just the big, you know, crowd. Yeah, like walking while we carried him up right. to his. So like, knowing how important it is to like you know certain cultures and stuff is it just floors me that some people just kind of look at it that way to Marcus's point it there's a there's a real sadness in that because all of us are mortal and all of us are going to someday be in a casket or Mm -hmm. or or what have you an urn or something right where we're sitting now yeah um and it's just to me I think of myself my family I would I just can't imagine not um making that whole funeral process that that th- those days or that day of visitation that funeral day um one of the most important in a family's history because um it's you know uh, a, f- a funeral quote is it's not just a, a you know the funeral day is not just a day in a lifetime it's a lifetime in a day yeah and you're trying to bring all that together yeah that's and, the perfect way to put and, it and actually. have people be able to walk out and say yeah I'm sad I'm grieving but boy am I glad we had this gathering yeah. and this support yeah. and and this this nice send off for mom or dad or grandpa or grandma, whoever it may be, you know what I mean? And I just think it's important. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that I get from being around here too, is sometimes you stress that too, to families. It's like, it's important for you to have that part of the process of of viewing the loved one. Cause it's part of like the grieving process, grieving process is you want to see them. You want to be able to see their body, Mm -hmm. come to terms with it. And it kind of like helps reality set in. Right. Cause sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't feel real. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and I'm always afraid people will get that, and it has happened. You know, the people that I was telling you about that would just do, I call it cremation through email. Yeah. Um, they they think by doing that, that, and again, I'm not judging them. They can do what they want. Mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times what happens is you think you're you're disting, distancing yourself from grief and pain. You're not. It, you're just. You're just dragging it out. In yeah. my opinion, it, and it kind of becomes. You start having those dreams. I, I call them lost in the woods dreams. You're dreaming because you haven't seen your loved one. Right. It's hard for your mind to say, "Okay, they're gone." Mm-hmm. You know, they they have separated from the earth, from this life, and um, 
you 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 wake up with a sweat thinking they're lost in the woods somewhere. You know yeah. what I mean? What's going on over there, Marcus? <laughs> no, I thought I heard something. I thought I heard a woman's <laughs> voice. <laughs> so I was like, I thought maybe it was like the back of your throat or something. No. Is that a very a feminine voice? No. There? <laughs> Got a very manly voice over here. <laughs> you really heard a woman? I thought I did, yeah. Wow. So it's that was one of the things I've all, I've never yeah. actually talked to Steve about about that. I think we'll save that for the end of the podcast, but... Yeah. He believes in, in stuff he cannot see. <laughs> yeah, he it's just strange. told me a story like before yeah, we it's, hit it's record. Strange I was like, too, wow. Because <laughs> um, we've been doing this podcast for a long time. and um, <laughs> A while. And it's always the strange... I mean, you work in a funeral home. You've been in, mm. been in this industry for some time. And you would expect that. But mm-hmm. you would also expect the person not to believe in, you know what I mean? Like yeah. a ghost or a spirit. And I think we've come across people like that where they present themselves in such a way. And then you ask them about something along those lines and it just like a, a it like for sl- some, a sometimes they kind of like hesitate and then well i have this one story they all, it always comes out right. i have this one story <laughs> yeah we've we've uh done podcasts with people and we always try to push it towards the end and that's i think it's we'll do it with this podcast too but it'll be worth it <laughs> yeah it's always it's always a strange thing to see it's yeah. like the the switch yeah. that turns on it's it's different yeah but um <laughs> i mean so i mean we've We've been, like we were just saying, we've been around this growing up, and I'm pretty sure many people have, is especially if you're Native, um, growing up in this culture, having to deal with deaths in the family and things like that, always being around that. But when it happens to someone who's immediately close to you, how do you, like, what's the process of dealing with that? What what do you do first? Yeah, and uh, thankfully, again, here... um the Crow tribe, they believe in a healthy funeral culture. Mm-hmm. That that's a that's a great start because down here, even I would say more so than 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 other families fifty miles away. Let's say um, there's so much immediate support, you, mm-hmm. and you know what I mean. The whole family comes together. Yeah, you know, and I mean it's and and just taking you two when we start talking about your extended family, yeah, that's a chapel full. You know what I mean? But my point is that's your support structure and it starts right away. The, the first thing you should do is <clears throat> spend time with your loved one wherever they are if you can before yeah. the funeral home's yeah. even called. But have a funeral home picked. Should be Bullis Mortuary, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> but have a funeral home picked, really do, and talk about <laughs> talk with your family and visit with them and and get an idea just the general okay we're going to call this funeral home um and they're going to take you know are we going do we want a traditional funeral do we want a funeral just start those ideas going your support system extended families coming in yeah and and then the next day after that gives you that time the funeral home will call you, and then we set up the arrangement time, and we go through all the details. But that's the most important part: is start deciding what you, as a family, want from from the funeral home you choose to an idea, at least maybe not the details, but an idea of what direction you want this to go. Maybe what cemetery yeah. we want to do, or, or or even who's going to officiate. You know, right. um, that that's the neat part down here is we have different different backgrounds for everybody. We have Catholic backgrounds. Mm-hmm. We have NAC backgrounds. We have Foursquare. We mm-hmm. have, you know, the Baptist church, the yeah. Pentecostals down. Mm-hmm. So have that idea. And, and <clears throat> within a short amount of time, that support structure is coming around you. I mean, you guys know that, yeah. I, you know, it, it comes around you pretty quick, but just having the basic ideas of where, when, and how, and and that's what we're here to do is kind of give you a gentle nudge in the back and to, and to flesh those details out. So, right, like being so close to like the reservation mm-hmm. and having like you know um, traditional families um, coming in to have their funerals and stuff done here. Um, do you ever have like um, those moments where they want one part one person wants it traditional and the other person doesn't want it traditional? Like, how do you go about, how do they go about that? Yeah, not so much here. It's interesting because that kind of goes into cremation law a little bit. Right. Um, And it's very important. Um, So uh, uh, what I deal with more honestly, honestly, is like, well, is the, is 
cultural law versus Montana law. Yeah. So in other words, I get a lot of folks that come in and say, well, we don't do it that way here. And so that puts me right kind of in a squeeze once in a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because it's like, well, this is, you know, or, or my favorite one of all is always, well, I'm power of attorney. Well, people need to know that power of attorney is gone the moment someone passes away. Mm, there is no yeah. power of attorney. It's It's gone. Yeah. And so Montana law, basically, I won't quote the whole thing because we will be snoring by the time I get through <laughs> yeah. that. But b basically, it's kind of based on the old common law next of kin. Yeah. So, so more often than not, if there's a living spouse, legally married living spouse, that that spouse has, it's called priority right of disposition. So that spouse would have it. In the absence of a spouse, it moves to a majority of adult biological children. So that's oftentimes where it gets a little bit fun. Yeah. I had a case one time and this was this was an argument between between traditional burial and cremation. Six children. Three children were of one religion. Three children were Roman Catholic. I just remember that. Wow. You know, I don't remember that. So you had three that were the opposite of Roman Catholic and three Roman Catholic kids. <laughs> oh, wow. Man. The Roman Catholic kids wanted the full burial. The mm. other kids wanted cremation. Now that ended up um, us having to, to basically hold that person in refrigeration. It had to go to court to be decided by a wow. judge. Wow. And it took two months. <laughs> Wow. It took two wow. months. And that in the end, what's, what's funny in the end is um, it took uh, it took one one of the, uh, I don't remember the church, anyway, one of the kids to join the Roman Catholic kids, and they ended up deciding on a full burial. So, But that's generally how it works. Spouse, then a majority of biological kids. So Jeez. I can't two do... Two months. I can't do a cremation without... Uh, like if, if, if mom passes away and dad has already been passed away for a while and let's mm -hmm. say there's four kids, yeah, I need three of them to sign that cremation authorization. If so, do all, they all have to sign. So it has to be the majority, everybody? majority, a majority wow. of the yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. So what if let's Man. say somebody's married and they're split up. Okay. Say <laughs> so they're separated. They're separated. Like, haven't seen each other for let's yeah. like maybe a year or two. And that person ends up passing away. How does that work? It just depends on if there's been a petition filed for divorce or, or, or formal. If separation. there's some sort of paper, paper trail, I guess then. Then, sh then she or he's. You out. better hope she doesn't hate you. In right. I <laughs> know. Yeah, if, if any type of proceeding legally started for dissolution, that person's out. Right. That has nothing account. to do with me. Yeah. I'm just saying. I, we I, have, I, I, no, no. I just. <laughs> I don't know why. I just pointed toward you <laughs> there, but uh. we know somebody well that has something like that. But it's like, man, what if? Like, what, what, if this, what if he dies? Or something? <laughs> yeah. As long as something's been filed in right. terms of beginning the process of dissolution, then that person doesn't retain any rights anymore. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Like, they'll ask, like, what did he want, buried or cremated? He wanted to be buried. Well, I'm going to cremate him. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Vengeance, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I told our brother, um, he is always coming to my house, and when he would come around, he would always go for our cereal nonstop. <laughs> yeah, he would just put his hand in our freaking our bags, and I'm like, you didn't even wash your hands or anything. He does it at mom's house too. And I was like, man, when you go, I'm gonna cremate you and put you in a cereal box. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You'll be happy. <laughs> oh boy. Well, there's only one other brother, so that. I know who it is. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh. yeah. Yeah. So like, so what are the options of cremation? Like how does, is there different options that really important subject that I think isn't covered enough by funeral professionals? Mm -hmm. Um, we were just talking about how important it is to view how important it is to have that physical closure. Mm. I think most people think, and a lot of people do it for money reasons. And I understand that, you know, because generally speaking, you know, you don't have a casket, you don't have, it's, it's, it's cheaper in terms of monetary specifically to cremate rather than bury. So a lot of people think that, gosh, um, and it's not really that way here because our the way we structure things is really special anyway. But with cremation, you have that option to say goodbye to your loved one and, and you don't, don't have to buy a 
casket that can be cremated. We've done um, several funerals in the past where somebody comes to me and says, look, I want my kids to see dad. I want, I want to see dad. I want, you know, I want the community to come out, but I don't have eight grand or, or whatever it would pencil out to. And I say, that's fine. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll say, I, th I think we want to have a cremation and not do a burial or do a scattering or something like that. But they forget that you can blend those two things together. Yeah. So you can have, you know, if, if, if you would allow us to prepare the body for a public viewing, which is embalming. I just don't like the word embalming, but that's yeah. what it is, embalming. Um, and allow us to get that body prepared properly for you. We can have a public goodbye and everybody that you want to say goodbye to that individual, you can. Uh, and then we can cremate afterwards. Mm -hmm. There's a whole range of options. And the reason, the reason I always say embalming, embalming, embalming is because anti-funeral groups out there are like, well, you don't need to have the body embalmed. And I'm like, they don't know anything about what they're talking about. Yes, you do, because that's how a body's preserved. Yeah. You know, uh, you you could you could take two identical bodies, same size, weight, um, picked up at the same time. Let me embalm one and put it in the room next to the one that's not embalmed, and let's see who wins after four days. It's it would be oh, a very yeah. noticeable difference. You know what yeah. I mean? So it is important, and, and I just wanted to throw that little tidbit out there because even some of my tribal families. It's a word that you, know, you kind of know what embalming in a general sense, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it makes them viewable, you know, yeah. which it does. But um, it's so much more than that because I can, I can have children that are a long way away or, or any, someone in the hospital or something and say, hey, um, my aunt won't be here, can't be here for a week. Can you keep them that long? And absolutely. Now with a, with a body that's not embalmed, if they say, well, can we just see them in a week? The odds are I'm going to say no. Or if I do, I have to limit it to immediate family in like five minutes, you know, right, because yeah. there are things that get that we just can't control at that point. You know what I mean? So there, there's my embalming plug. I, I tell people, even if you're going to cremate, but you want a viewing, please let me embalm them. It's the best $500 you'll ever spend. Right. Because... It, that takes all of the pressure, biological pressure away. Mm -hmm. How does it actually that work? How does the embalming process, how does that, how does it actually, actually preserve you? Like what's the like makeup of that? Yeah. So it's generally now it's a percentage of formaldehyde. Okay. Which it's always been kind of the, kind of the bed, but the active ingredients always been mm -hmm. formaldehyde. But nowadays with the chemicals we use, um, well, they build so much stuff in there. They, they build co-injection uh, co chemicals, pre-injection chemicals, um, chemicals with humectant in them too. But the formaldehyde is designed to, for, for lack of a better term, synthesize proteins in your body. So you take, uh, you know, your muscle tissue, if you got it under a microscope, there's all these individual protein cells making up. Mm. So, so what formaldehyde does, these modern ones, is they, it just makes a ring around the protein cell and it keeps the bad bacteria from getting into that protein cell because bacteria is what starts to break us down, right, yeah. cause the odor, the discoloration okay. and all of that. So, so what it does is it synthesizes the protein and kills the bacteria. And so modern embalming chemicals are, are a wonder because it, it, when you treat embalming as an art and a science, which you should, um, the results can be phenomenal for people. I, I remember a gentleman in Billings that I, I, the family was in Europe and I embalmed him and it was, I think I held him for four months without wow. refrigeration or yeah, anything, we just, you know, it's really, it's, it really gives you a, a, a real a different lot of time. Now, now there are times where, um, let's say a body comes in that's maybe been deceased for a period of time. Mm. Now that's what I call your behind the eight ball before you start. It's not magic. I mean, the, yeah. The, yeah. <laughs> there are biological circumstances where you got to tell the family, look, I'm going to do this. And, and the way I do it is if I can't get the preservation level to the level I want it at, I'll tell the family, I'm not going to charge you for that. But let me try. Let me try because that might be the only way we're going to have 
that time, that private time to view and, and everything like that. Right. So Yeah, we were just talking about that. It's how long can they actually sit? And that is ins- I didn't think it was going to be that he long. Was, he was telling me that they could be uh, buried for a couple of years and still look. Come on, just like still. They, like they just left here, good. right? Pretty much. Yeah, I, like I was telling Cindy. Then, oh, how, how many years? Like A couple of years. <laughs> Oh, there's a, there's a, I can't, I don't know where, I wish I could have written this down or would have, but they, they were deconstructing a mausoleum above ground Mm -hmm. crypts, you know, in California where in a part of California where it's really dry and, uh, they, I don't remember the reason they had to open these caskets. I don't know if it was for identification or to verify whatever, maybe some of the, but that was such a hot and dry climate. Um, when they opened some of those caskets and some of those people were at 50 to 60 years, they looked exactly the same as they did. the day. <laughs> <Nuts>. <laughs> oh, Wow. That is crazy. It doesn't happen. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> so I'm still going to be looking good. Like, yeah, you yeah. So there's a, there's they don't a look good now. So. <laughs> there, there's a story that will tie this and it's really close to home just to give you an idea. So, and when I say modern chemicals, I would say probably from 1960 on mm-hmm. was modern in terms of, you know, and certainly through the 90s now, there's a, I, the next generation of embalming chemicals and such. But there was a Vietnam, and this is a friend of mine, I won't mention his funeral home because I didn't get permission to talk about it. But mm-hmm. there was a, a, a young man that was 19 years old. He was killed in the Vietnam War, 1965. Oh, wow. And he wasn't in combat. He, he was actually a Navy person he was on a ship and one of the shell casings from a mortar split and it it hit him in the in the head and 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 took his life okay wow. and and did quite a little quite a little cosmetic damage mm-hmm. in the process so that young man uh, the military they're phenomenal phenomenal um and thanks to them but uh, just phenomenal embalmers the way they're trained it he was embalmed in Germany, I believe. If not, it would have been Dover, Delaware. But Germany, I think, is where the Vietnam um, kids went to get embalmed. Anyway, he he got shipped home to Montana here. And the military, um, it was a combination metal casket vault. And that's the, the body was in there, and that was what they buried in. Of course, they told Mom, you can't see him. So he was buried, and in... 2016, 17, so let's just say Fairly 50, recently. 50 years later. Yeah, yeah. Wow. 50 years later, 2015, hit the mom finally passed away. And one of her final wishes was to have him exhumed from the cemetery, removed from that metal casket combo, and cremated because she had ended up moving down to Arizona and wanted his cremains to be buried with her. And... I'll cut it down a little bit, the story, but but in the end, when that was opened and they unwrapped the wrappings that they used to, uh, and I saw the photographic evidence, I mean, down to the hair on the fingers. Wow. You could have done a viewing that day. You could have put a wow. suit on him that day, <laughs> other than the damage that had been done by the shell. Mm-hmm. But as far as the preservation goes... Um, he looked exactly as he did the moment he died in 1965. And, it's just and insane. I didn't know it lasts like that long. Yeah, I thought long it was just time. like a couple of years, and then yeah. you start turning into bones. It, like I told C. <laughs> Dale, water is our biggest enemy. You know, yeah. water water foments heat, and heat foments bacteria, and so on and so forth. So it kind of depends on to me where where your grave site is, you know, as far as the, the rate of decomposition and things like that. But those are some interesting stories out there and they're verifiable, you know, and so that's why I love these, these anti-funeral groups are like embalming is just a way to cheat you out of money. And I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. (laughs) You know? So yeah, it's just nuts that, you know, but kind of makes you rethink uh, zombie movies. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some good looking zombies coming. <laughs> I know it's going to be a comment right again. It's like people are going to say that stuff. But. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's crazy. That has, to, that has a lot to do with this. Has the technology changed since how, like what's the turnaround on the technology? Yeah. I don't know. I, when you say change, I'm not, I, I just think there's more products out there. Like I was, there, there are, uh, there are, or I mentioned the term co-injection, which means nothing to nobody, but an embalmer, but, 
there are chemicals they make that standalone chemicals now that you'd mix with your regular arterial preservation solution, you know, but they're designed specifically to halt saprophytic bacteria spread and things like that. And those never use, but I mean, what a, you know, let's say you have a, a, someone that has been passed away for a few days and the family goes, man, can you do anything you can to, to, to get a viewing in for, and so now we have these extra helpers that attack rather than saying, okay, we better plan on a funeral tomorrow, you know, because I can't, and, and that still happens in rare cases, you know, but, but just those standalone chemicals have helped us so much with, um, being able to give a family the opportunity, um, to have their loved one present and viewable. And the same thing with reconstruction. I mean, um, again, there's so many variables that go into it, but there are so many tragedies, accidents, uh, whether it's motor vehicles or, or firearms or any falls, there's so much we can do now. Sometimes you can't, yeah. but it, it 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 all depends. At least we now have the opportunity to tell a family, "This is what I see. This is what we can do surgically, and this is what we cannot do surgically." Right. And you just tell them. But with, with the the skills you learn in mortuary school for reconstruction and restoration, coupled with some of these modern chemical advancements, oop, oop. I'm telling you that is a. a that's really something that um, is a gift, I think, to all of us, and it's a gift to the families to be able to do that. Yeah, so I think, the, I think one thing people would want to know is what happens after their loved one is taken with you? Like once mm-hmm. you come and pick them up, mm-hmm. like what's the process that happens? So in modern times now, I, you know, we get calls from families all the time from the hospital, let's just say in Billings as an example. Mm-hmm. The family will call us first, call the, call the bullis number, which is kind of nice about here because we, we don't use, we don't utilize an answering service. It's just us. We have the phones with us all the time. Yeah. Some employee of the business does, but oftentimes we get called, you know, immediately at bedside, you know, by a family member. So most hospitals, most nursing homes, there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a postmortem care that they provide. Okay. And so, um, oftentimes the, uh, in a hospital, the body is moved to a holding area that's designed specifically for funeral homes to come and enter and leave kind of under the cover of darkness, so to speak, yeah. o- only, only so as not to upset everybody. I mean, you wouldn't want us, you wouldn't want your funeral home coming through the cafeteria of the hospital. Yeah. I mean, so they, they design ways for us to come in and out that, that are, are meant to kind of protect the dignity of the deceased and also the living who are like, Oh my goodness, there's a funeral home coming through the cafeteria. I mean, that's, yeah. that's hyperbole. But, um, one of the big things that families need to be aware of is under Montana law. So like either of you two organ donors on your driver's license? No. I don't think so. I was before, I think once before, but I don't think so I let's, am anymore. Let's just say Marcus was. Mm-hmm. Let's just say he was an organ donor. So that's an advanced directive. So if Marcus were to pass away in the hospital bed up there and he had that organ donor checked on his driver's license, even mm-hmm. his wife can't tell the recovery people, no, I don't want it. Because that trumps even her. So those are things to think about. So, so automatically bodies are, are referred uh, before even the funeral home's called. If the family didn't, doesn't call us, the hospital will. But not until there's been a referral made to, to a tissue procurement agency, which includes corneas. That's, yeah. that's generally one. And then the, um, if the family is to allow, we've had everything from um, long bones full thickness tissue graft material removed, um, corneas, everything. And so what I want our families down here to know, um, specifically our Crow families that are tuning in and our Cheyenne families is that is fine. I am not against donation at all. Mm -hmm. My dad is a, is a liver transplant survivor. He's an organ. Sur- I mean, wow. he, he's a, sur- he's a transplant survivor. So I certainly do not, mm. 
have any ill will, but what I, what I feel that families should know is it changes the dynamic about what's possible because generally when long bones are removed and things like that, so is the vasculature that goes with them, arteries, veins, the things that I need for our embalming process. Wow. And so when a family says, well, we allowed full long bone tissue and all of that, that's absolutely fine. And what it does change is the ability to have this delayed funeral that I'm telling you about because it really limits our options as to what we can do to preserve that body. It has to be a lot of topical work. We'll try to, I mean, I can't do the surgical embalming I do without blood vessels to yeah. do it with. And so when those are all gone, it, it really does limit limit what I can do uh, on a cellular basis, you know, down to it, down to the protein cell itself. I didn't know like it went that in depth. I thought it was just like your like your, your organs and stuff like that, like your well, liver. Or or organs your are different. Kidneys yeah, or, organs are different. To 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 be a true organ donator, do, donation customer. You, you have to pass a whole bunch of tests while you're still alive and you have to be on a ventilator. So if you've been off oh, the ventilator, to, yeah, they have to keep you alive. They have to keep you on a ventilator. If you're an organ, <laughs> if, if you, if you're an organ donor, tissue is different. So you got organ and tissue, which your eyes and your, your long bones are considered. So that, tissue. that kind of changes yeah, the, di- any of that. That like, changes uh, the dynamic it of like, does. Uh, yeah. about like pulling their plug or something. Yeah. That, that changes things, right? Yeah, and and they if a, if there's a candidate for organ donation, they're, they're going through a, a bunch of tests. The doctors usually told them, "Look, this is probably not probably. This is going to be a terminal." The family's made the decision that mm-hmm. life can't be sustained one way or the mm-hmm. other. Let's say a brain death or something, mm-hmm. um, and so they're already checking the viability of the organs for transplant, making sure there's no damage. And I, I mean, I don't want to talk like I'm a transplant coordinator, but that's the <laughs> gist of what goes on. Yeah, right. And then you have to be vented to, to do that. So there has to be oxygen going to your organs, even if let's say your brain is no longer with us, yeah, right. you know, so, so organ and tissue are completely different. Tissue can be taken after death. It's not a ventilator type situation. So, but a lot of times families will call and say, we haven't heard from you or how come you haven't called and it's because we haven't been called. We don't even know. So so tissue procurement referrals are done in every case. Now, there, there are age limits where they, it's a pretty easy no mm. based on age or, or, or a, a very bad diagnosis mm. of disease. Um, but a lot of times if a candidate has any viability, they'll hold that person for... 12, 14, 15, 16, 17 hours. So sometimes we literally don't know till the next day. Wow. Yeah. That's so yeah, that's cause I didn't know, like I didn't know it went that far, like mm-hmm. with how that worked because yeah. I thought they just take it after you passed away, you know, like, yeah. Cause and, and it's something that I think families should, I guess, come to expect when someone passes is you're probably gonna get some weird phone calls. Cause <laughs> yeah, Mark cause got, it, got, like, it was like not even an, it was, it was about an hour it was like they literally just not didn't even wait an hour. Like I got a phone call right away. Yeah, and they're asking. For, I called uh, you that yeah. night and I told you yeah. to expect that. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. said you're getting you're gonna get calls. Yeah, he told you me know? that, and yeah. uh, my dad's best friend uh, Vernon, mm-hmm. he told me too because yeah. like we sat in the waiting room and he was like, "Yeah, just to let you know, you're gonna get some weird phone calls." I was like, what do you mean? And he yeah. he even said that he he got woken up in the middle of the night once and he had to like let his wife at the time listen. Like you gotta hear hear what they're saying he's like because yeah i thought somebody was just messing with me yeah because and and even even though you were (laughs) you just had to have somebody hear it even though you were expecting because we went to target right after and we're in billings and we left and we you were with me right or did you just call me i remember i was in target we were outside on ben's house ben's where and in billings ben's house yeah who's ben ben Alethea's uncle. Oh, okay. that <laughs> Ben. Like, really? I was thinking of like our family, and I was like, Ben lives in Crow, Uncle Ben. But <laughs> oh, that's no, right, was, we yeah. were because we I were. Heard. Yeah, my phone rang, and then they're they're like, oh, like it was just like, yeah, sorry for your loss, you know, like, and then then it was just straight business after that. They're like, uh, can we have his eyes? You know, like his yeah. corneas. Yeah. Was like, well, like 
I'm glad Vernon like prepped me for that and you did too because I was like that's such a weird thing though. I was uh, like sorry for your loss but we want your dad's eyes yeah. kind of thing. And then Mark was like weirded out for like a little bit and told me I was like what the heck that's kind of weird but I think that's something uh, I remember dad making a joke about that before. He said, like, when I die, they're probably going to want my eyes because I have bionic vision. I was like, he, was <laughs> yeah. like, like he, he had, like, insane vision. Yeah, he had, <laughs> he he had the talking, best vision. Huh. He was always, like, bragging about how good his vision was. So. It's always 20-20. And I was like, it wasn't even, in, like, a joke because they really called, like, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys prepped me for that because I was like, man, it kind of caught me off guard, you know. And I called my mom and let her know, and she was like, no (laughs) (laughs) well like yeah they don't they they waste no time with that do they yeah i will say as as a general as a general rule tribal folks are more inclined to have their loved ones cross over whole you know what i mean they are they're like eunice like whatever you know they're they're not they don't want you know they don't want that particular thing to happen again i'm not judging it we do whatever but a f- the full tissue, full organ, again, do what you believe is right. Don't. It's not up to me. But as far as even, I think the long bone removal is mm-hmm. probably the most, from from our standpoint, the toughest to, you know, to fix, if you will, right. to repair. And, and in fact, it's not really repairable. You just you, you do what you can. You know? Do do you get to decide which what they take as an organ donor, so you can decide whether it's like internal or the bones or the donor does, but the, I don't think the family. Yeah, the they family won't know because Alethea see, is think, an organ donor. I'm like, I, I don't know. I have to look at my I have to look at my license now. <laughs> Make sure. I know that's yeah. happened where people have said no. I don't. You know, they get the phone call, and they're like, no, I I'm not interested or I don't want that, and they're like, well your loved one was a organ donor on his driver's license. What if I change my mind the last minute, like I'm in my bed and they're like, I changed my mind. I, I, I think there's a way. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a way, but I think you have to, I mean, it's gotta be documented, notarized, <laughs> witness, you know, all of that kind of I think thing. I yeah, like, you doing something like that. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if you're like in the bed, <laughs> can I get my attorney can, can, in here can, really quick? You yeah. know, yeah, trying to yeah. sign a paper and then it just like, <laughs> you know what I mean? That'd be like, <laughs> oh, it's too late. Just pick his <laughs> hand up and keep writing with the pen. You know, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah, what I mean, that. it's somewhat legal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know he did. So it. I was kind of wondered that, like yeah. that kind of stuff. So, what else have you wondered about? Like, do you have any questions? And they just kind of pop in as like as he's talking. So, and he, yeah. When we did, when our dad passed away, yeah. he was always a prepper and always made sure everything was taken care of. Yeah. And, um, like we, he always thought ahead. Yeah. And, um, it's kind of like you, people talk about certain things like with, uh, passings and death and, and whatnot, especially in Native American community is one thing they'll do is we notice this a lot. It was when someone's about to pass away, they'll do a lot of different things that are kind of out of their out of their character? i guess their yeah, their norm during the time like yeah. you know what i mean mm-hmm. like, like my dad would he went on this like whole tour of doing things he just he used to do but never did in the past couple of years is maybe he he's never visited i remember crow fair for like over a decade or so it like, was a while it was yeah. quite a while he would always go down there every year and take us with him when we we're growing up and he would visit our family down there at their camp and uh, around the time he was getting ready to go it was like um the year before he went to the crow fair and visited family and like wow my dad's down there because there's pictures on facebook and yeah he's doing a lot of stuff like that and, uh, and i think it was even the right before wasn't it yeah did, did he didn't he go down or was that the year before i think it was i was something like that but uh, then he visited our friends that uh he got friendly with uh our clients and we became really close to those guys too it's yeah. the bones body works and he went up there and visited with them for a bit and he was barely trying to get around to he was there like two weeks before he passed away, yeah. wasn't he? And he went like, and bought, and all he went in there is bought these little chains that are like, like don't necklaces. Really, yeah, they go to nothing. But he bought those, made sure he was in there and bought them. And, and we didn't hear about that until his passing, but it's kind of strange. Have you heard things like that? People are doing things out of their, their norm? Yeah, especially people that, that maybe know. And I don't specifically. I thought Champs, didn't that, he had a diagnosis, but didn't it kind of really come on more suddenly, your yeah. dad's? I oh, mean, yeah. it he wasn't was in, a, like He was in remission. Yeah, but I think, yes, you do. 
um, I don't know, some people call it get it all in syndrome, yeah. you know, or some things they really feel are important that they've missed that they haven't followed up on some friendships, mm. some family, you know, I, I hear the most someone that has a diagnosis, even if they end up surviving it, but they're thinking to themselves, this may be a terminal diagnosis. I may have limited days, which if you think about it, we all have limited oh, days. Yeah. yeah. You know, we'll have less days tomorrow than we did today, but yeah. they find that as way to a, bring the mood down there. Right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're welcome, Marcus. Uh, but it's like a, it's like an impetus to to right wrongs and to and to mend fences and do things like that yeah. too. And I think that it, it just it just really brings into focus your mortality, you know. And it's like uh, this is important to me, and I want to address it. Right. You know. So yeah, that makes sense. Like you know, you, you're thinking this. You know, this could this could take me. So I might as well kind of go and try to do everything, you know, visit people, see people right. before I pass. That and kind of thing. It, I've kind of had that that feeling though, is because like when the I guess when Jonah passed away, mm. um, Alethe told me that morning. I was like, man, I wish I went and got to see him, or you know what I mean? Yeah. And it kind of makes you think about because we had like a lot of stuff planned with yeah. him, and even like running into him at the store and stuff, we'd like talk about it and everything, right. and kind of like being excited about it. And yeah, and then he called, he's the one that called me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it kind of makes you think of like, you want to make sure you visit people anyways, because yeah. like you don't, you don't know. And that was like a shocker to us. It's that like, was that like, there was like no, like really, that one really caught me off guard. I was like, wow. Yeah. Like, wow. about that and one? Even, even Sam, yeah. um, his passing, Peyote Sam is, we talked about him on the pod, the podcast. Yeah, too. He was going to come over to your house yeah, too. and do some, tell us some ghost stories and things. And then, then he, he had a lot up. of, like a, I heard some of his stories and whoa, wow. <laughs> he has yeah. some really good stories too. But it's just a, it's really strange and it's a really interesting subject to even talk about of, of what people do before they go and how do they even like premonition almost, right. yeah. you know, like they're having premonitions, even subconsciously yeah. that something's not right. Mm. And you might not even, you might not even notice that in the here and now, but somehow there's a subconscious element to that that's pushing you to do right. that. Yeah. You know? So it's like you're just doing it without even, yeah, well, well not even noticing, yeah. right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but he, like I was saying, he was like a big guy about pre-planning things and my dad was always freaked out about certain things he'd make sure he gets something done when i was like this tall he'd even tell me i'm not gonna be here i'm not gonna be here forever just let, let, to let you know I'm like a little kid like <laughs> he like would do it and prepare you that young he you would know, do it mean? a lot thanks and, uh, dad yeah, yeah <laughs> like try to sleep now so, yeah it's like you're thinking he's gonna die like tomorrow but. i know the way he talked i'm like why does he always say that? You know oh, what's funny mom. is is uh, my mom is uh, she's got some poor circulation and uh, <laughs> especially like in her free her feet yeah. and um, dad would just well he was he was gone for a little bit and I went to mom mom's house and we were just talking and then she has this thing where she just dozes off and I was like so I went to the bathroom came back and I was gonna talk to her and she dozed off and I'm trying to wake her up I'm like mom. And she's not answering me. And I'm like, Mom. And no answer. And she just, <laughs> the way she's like just looks, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was like, Mom. And I touched her foot cold. And I was all, Mom. <laughs> and she jumps up. Jumps I'm like, up. you can't do that. <laughs> that freaked me out. <laughs> I don't know. Like, she's always like cold. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! That, that woman has uh, the greatest sense of humor, though, because <laughs> oh, yeah. at Champ's funeral, you know, at the at the end, you know how the dismissal goes. Yeah. And, um, of course, the family's the last to come out, and your mom's sitting there, and Mary. I think Mary was there, and a few other, you know, family members are right around her. You know, I was I was helping her like well stand up. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And I kind of leaned over just to, you know, because I wanted to walk out with you guys yeah. or with her. And I kind of, I just kind of grabbed her hand and, and she looked at me or I said, I said, are you making it okay? And she looks at me, I mean, no expression. She looks at me and she yeah. goes, how's my hair? <laughs> she, she had to do I, that. I she had to do, how's my hair? And I said, your hair is magnificent. <laughs> then she goes, 
you wouldn't lie to me, would you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, ma'am. I won't lie to you at all. But she's always worried. Just, just always that, worried about her. Yeah, but just that humor, too. Yeah. I mean, she was. She was like, yeah. She gets into these situations, oh too, where God. she says things, and it's like way out of place, and you're just yeah. like, Mom. <laughs> I don't think now. Tone it down, mom. You know? <laughs> like, really? No. That's what you're worried about right now? <laughs> yeah. Your hair? How's yeah. my hair? <laughs> so, oh, but I she didn't it. ask me how mine was. So, that's what really bothered me. <laughs> yeah. I had just gotten a perm, you know? So, I mean. Yeah. yeah. That's oh, what I was thinking, yeah. too, is like these headphones. Steve doesn't have to worry about his hair being <laughs> like that. Like mine. No. Yeah. No. But I was like I was saying, I keep trying to get to that. Is like he was always like pre-planning and things, and he made mm-hmm. sure that he pre-planned everything about his his funeral. Made sure everything was paid for, and and made sure everything was taken care of, and put me and Marcus in charge of that. But um, why do you think that's important to do for like it's like thinking about your funeral? Why do you think that's important to like pre-plan and make sure things before are before it's even close? Oh, right. Yeah, it's. Um well, you guys know because you've been through it and you've been through it yeah. recently. Um, so it's kind of, there's kind of two reasons I think that pre-planning is so important. Mm-hmm. One is even if, even if you, let's say you want to just plan your funeral and not pay for it, just the planning process takes so much burden off. I've seen families come in that are so distraught and so full of grief. They're like, I can't even concentrate long enough to answer your questions. I may be asking them questions related to the completion of the death certificate, biographic yeah. data that I need. And they're, they're just, it's, it's like the deer in the headlights. So if you as an individual say, Hey, look, I want to remove this burden from my wife, my kids, my grandkids, whoever it may be. That is one reason in and of itself to come in and say, this is why, this is why, uh, this is the way I want it. When the kids come in, I mean, you can get as detailed or, or non-detailed as you want to, down to what music I want to play or what what yeah. video theme I mm. want or any of that. Have all your biographic data done. Have a general idea of what you're thinking about in your funeral. Right. That that's one part. It it relieves so much stress and burden from your family. Mm-hmm. And the funeral director then can assume the position of helping just put that hand in the small of your back, as I call it, and just kind of help you through. That's really it. And and you can be like, I don't know what, guess what? It's already here. Mm-hmm. We're already working on it. You don't have to worry about it. Dad yeah. came in and told us what he wanted. Yeah. Reason two is more of a financial um, reason. The reason some people like to pre-plan and prepay their funeral and disclaimer, when you come and when people come and prepay a funeral, um, Montana is a trust law state. So when you write a check to the funeral home for your pre need, mm-hmm. that doesn't go into Steve's pocket and you can call me in Vegas in a day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that money has to go into a specified trust account. So it doesn't belong to the funeral home. It's always your money until right. you pass away. Then we become trustee and use, use those funds to pay what you've set up. That's right. it. But up until that day, it's always your money. You can pull it. You can take it. But the advantage of prepaying is, A, it's going to be cheaper now than it's going to be because there's inflation. Yeah, you know, right. There's, there's inflation. And your folks were really wise about that because even though there was a tribal allotment, it mm. wasn't enough to cover everything. Right. You know what I mean? So they were very, they were very um, ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. To, to do those policies that they did. It was really good. And it didn't it take something off you? Oh, and yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I remember we, you know, in Al's case, we ordered some stuff that normally that would have had to come out of your pocket. But then, yeah. you know, nice nice things, nice memoriams. Yeah. Nice it was things nice to have that, like, um, that cushion. That cushion is exactly like, it. Was it. big cushion, so it was, like, nice to actually, like, yeah. not have to worry about it. Yep. Like just, oh, like we want this or we want that. And you don't even have to worry about the price, even yep. though it was like, you know, yep. some yeah. of that stuff gets pretty pricey. It does. You know? so. It does. The third, the third wheel or the third angle of that is, is legal and that's Medicaid. So, and again, the, the, this is something that uh, a social security officer or a, v, or a uh, 
someone from Social Security could could really brief you on or the state Medicaid office. So let's say someone ends up having to go into a nursing home. They can't care for themselves Mm -hmm. or a spouse can't care for them. So basically for the state to take over your care, you're going to end up spending down your assets. You're not going to be able to have a a $200,000 portfolio. You will if you're married, one half of that will. But my point is, that's going to be a spend down. They're going to let you have $2,000 to your name, basically. And the rest of your assets are going to go to pay for your care. Okay, the state gets reimbursed, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, if you prepay your funeral, that is a that is no longer considered an asset. It's not touchable by Medicaid or anyone. So it doesn't count against your your assets. So in other words, they can't come after the money you've set aside for your funeral. So if you've set that money aside, now it's not your children or other family members going, oh crud, um, mom didn't have a, a prearrangement. And here we are now. Now we got to come up with with all this money. Mm-hmm. So, so if mom paid for it herself ahead of time, um, that's not, it's not count counted against that spend down for Medicaid. And so that money's always protected. And that's another really big reason that money's always there. Right. It's always protected. So there, there's really, those are the three big, big reasons. I, you know, I, I, burden is one and just straight Finance is the other. Prices are cheaper now than they will be. And the other is the legal as it relates to Medicaid and that asset spend down. Should you become, you know, uh, someone that's that's primarily cared for by the state. So. Right. And I think it's something to think about, even if you are healthy or even if you are young. I think thinking about that is something to get into. I mean, it's smart. Yeah, it is. Well, I was thinking about having a just a night that you advertise in the paper and the briefs or something. Mm-hmm. Just to have a night similar, not on camera necessarily, or you could record it, mm-hmm. but just inviting the community in right. to say, hey, here's a night. Ask me about prearrangements. Ask mm-hmm. them, without me selling anything. I don't really have to sell pre-needs. Right. I, I, I mean, um, it, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I, I want people to do pre-needs, but that wouldn't be the point. It would be to inform them right. about uh-huh. this subject matter we're talking about. Because yeah. it, you know, it, it's it, important. Because it gets you know? people upset. Like yeah. when once when it comes down to it, people yeah. get upset about it. Like the pricing and uh, speaking of that, and how how does how is a funeral priced? Like how does the the process work of that? So ba- basically, all, all funeral homes are the same. There's um, their their prices may not be the same, but there's a structure. Um, so funeral fun, the funeral industry is regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. They, they, we in the business call it the funeral rule. You know, it's certain disclosures, certain um, price lists, and certain things we have to have available and ready. Um, mm-hmm. The other part of the, of the FTC rule is basically they allow us to charge a basic service fee, and so that's everything. Um, I, gu- I guess that's the one thing where we kind of incorporate everything. You take how many cases you have in a year, you figure out what your overhead is and your expenses, you know, for the year, payroll, your auto insurance, your light bill, your gas bill, water, all of that, mm-hmm. salaries, and you divide it out by the number of cases. And your basic service fee should be close to that just to cover your costs, in other words. Mm-hmm. Okay, so every funeral home has a basic service fee. And and then there's other itemized fees. We, we don't package price here. We uh, we itemize. So everything from embalming to transportation mm-hmm. to all of that. And then we have a separate price list required for outer burial containers and caskets. So that's that's generally how we do it. But we, we here um, are, are kind of sensitive to the fact that there are a lot of families we serve that we know immediately um, that money is going to be an issue. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And and funerals, you know, the average casketed funerals, which I say we do about 80% casketed funerals here. Mm-hmm. But if you were to go up the road, I'd say your average cost of a funeral is anywhere from, you know, 7800 to 8500 and, and up. Yeah. So... We've kind of purposely kept our prices low. We include some things that other funeral homes don't, you know, uh, that they may charge you for on a line item basis. We've just rolled all that in because down here for our tribal folks, we know there's a, a, a tribal death benefit that's paid. And so 
it, in general terms, it's, it's not quite enough to cover the funeral, but it's pretty yeah. close. So we try to keep the burden on the families down here. We try really hard um, to, to, you know, five to seven to eight hundred dollars tops over that, unless they do want to spend money and buy a nicer cast. Certainly they can do yeah. that. But we just try to, to provide that lower cost option to keep it as close as we can. Um, so that these families aren't having to come up with so much extra. Yeah. But if you were to, if you could do a funeral for six to $800, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? So knowing the rest is covered. So. Right. So, I mean, we talked about like what happens when you pick up people from the hospital and whatnot, but you're not the coroner. I think people kind of have a, a like the confusion about that. Yeah. So what's the difference between what you do and what a coroner does? Yeah, so so a coroner is a state official. I mean, a local, every county's got one. Some are civilians. Some are, you know, uh, have been assumed by the sheriff's office. You mm -hmm. know, where the you see a lot of in Montana, uh, the office of sheriff coroner. So where we're at here in Bighorn County, um, it's still a civilian coroner. So he, that person runs for election uh, every four years, like a sheriff does. So. So what a coroner does, and I've been a coroner for uh, a long time, and, and you're right, the coroner's office was here for, for many, many years until right. Mr. Bullis retired, mm -hmm. and, then, and then it became a, a civilian position. Um, and uh, the, the coroner is really responsible for, for a few very important things. And I, I, I apologize. I have to use examples as the best way to explain right. it, you know? So, um, so if there's a car accident, let's say any type of accident, the coroner assumes jurisdiction or has certainly has the authority to assume jurisdiction. And really what the coroner is doing is in the end to decide, decide the cause and manner of death. That's really his job. You know, was it a, <clears throat> was it a natural death? Was it an accident, suicide, homicide, undetermined, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing. And then the cause would be blunt force trauma or something mm -hmm. like that. There's cause and manner there. Blunt force trauma, accident. There's your cause and manner. But but some of the situations where the coroner would be involved. So if you <clears throat> are taken to the emergency room and admitted to the hospital and you pass away, after being in that hospital less than 24 hours, that would be a coroner call. An unattended death would be a coroner call. A pure accident, like I described on the highway or a yeah. fall or anything like that, mm -hmm. that would be um, infants and toddlers, that's a coroner call. Uh, death on the job site would be uh, a coroner jurisdictional call too. So in Montana, it's kind of a shared system. Um, the state medical examiners in Billings, uh, unfortunately, a, a lot of folks are familiar with that because um, a lot of the coroners, you know, so, so the state medical examiner in Billings is an MD. He's a medical doctor, so he's a pathologist. So oftentimes the coroners will call the state medical examiner's office and say, okay, doc, this is what I have. These are the circumstances. But every now and then, any of us that have investigated a death or, or, or at the scene of a death, and you can't quite, not sure you can put it all together. You're taking photographs, you're, do, you're talking to witnesses, you're documenting everything at the scene, but you're like, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. And you call the doctor, the medical examiner, and he says, well, I'm not quite sure either. Let's do an autopsy. And that's where the big... Uh, autopsy word comes in, which obviously there's a lot of them mm -hmm. that are done. Um, and that is to establish, is there a physical cause of death upon that examination? There's always a toxicology, uh, a toxicology draw that goes with that, plus a, a, a very intensive internal examination and external examination. And so um, in, in the end, I know people get upset and because they want, you know, they want their loved one to be here or, or at a funeral home. They, they want their loved one um, to be in what we were talking about before, that family grieving process. And yeah. so that it does take some time, you know, and oftentimes a weekend will pass sometimes with their loved. But really all they're trying to do is really, truly establish the cause and manner of death. Because if you think it was a, I, I'm, I'm just 
making this up hypothetically, but if you think it was a, um, a heart attack and ended up being the result of a fall, which may have been someone else's fault for so you, in the end, everybody wants to know the state feels they have a compelling legal interest to know Mm -hmm. in those circumstances, what caused, Mm -hmm. what caused it, you know, because then they want to, you know, it's, it's the old story of, well, the more we know, the more we can help prevent it. The same thing happening in the future if such a thing happens, but that's kind of how the system works. And uh, the funeral home is not involved with, with that type of, we we can only get involved to, to take care of your loved one when, that that person has been released to us by the medical examiner or the coroner. So right, well, there's going to be a test, Marcus. When yeah, can I follow up on that? <laughs> so as I long mean, as it's multiple choice, yeah. I, mean, I do good on those. Uh, so so coming in, like this is probably your first time being in here, especially at night. Um, I know there's probably some questions in the back of your head because there was certainly for me coming into the business with you is like what happens in the the funeral home do you have any like questions of like what happens like in like the back room or yeah i've always kind of kind of wondered about that like, like i was yeah. I, I was i i seen it and it's it's somewhat kind of like what you would expect it's almost like a hospital kind of feel to it and an operating room right, is what yeah, a lot of right, people exactly. will say it reminds them of is the preparation so like what what's some some questions that jump out at you like how does what's going through your head on that <laughs> oh my gosh um well more of the questions i would ask because <laughs> he probably already <laughs> knows because like um i know like like this is like not really like questions about like business side of it right, and everything right like the questions i was always have the of technical like, side yeah like um dealing with you know bodies and stuff like that like i hunt you know and there's nerves in the animals that you have mm-hmm. to get out like you know um does that ever happen back there like do they move while you're <laughs> while they're in the no well in the room no really. never never no, ever really did no that there that's in that the old uh I love because I still hear it to this day. Is like, I remember so and so's uncle used to work for, yeah, Jimmy John's funeral home, and he went to pick someone up, and he was driving down the road and looked in the rearview mirror, and that body sprang right yeah. up on him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like hearing stories and like that. So like, that's the old cadaveric spasm. Yeah, does that happen? Does that no, happen? No, it though? doesn't. Uh, um, well. One, uh, there are a few things that would imitate that, but not not to that degree. Yeah. Um. So so sometimes we're talking about embalming, and I have actually seen where the fluid is making its way like it should through the yeah. through the arteries. And I one time I had a finger just kind of moving, just going like this, but you could actually see the movement of the under the skin. You know what? Not under yeah. the, but you can see the the movement through the vasculature. Right, I'm curious about so, that. I was curious about that too because Alethea told me, and this is probably like. The, those kind of like uh, tall tales kind of things. But, uh, <laughs> Urban legend. Right. Yeah. But she, Urban had, legend. she had a story that she's seen on TikTok mm-hmm. and she said they were doing an embalming process on somebody and for some reason there was like some sort of like something around the neck and the person, they said maybe muscle memory did it, but that person went up and reached and grabbed their neck. <laughs> like, is that plausible? I don't... That big of a movement, yeah. I mean, would <laughs> that would get me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. If I'm back there, Seadale, and that uh-huh. happens, I'm going to have my own naga hide shop or flower <laughs> shop the next day because I'm not staying. So, I, I you know, I, I, no, it doesn't. And, and yeah. I've got it on good authority that um, there's a pathologist that used to work in the area and he would, you know, people would bring this up, you know, mm-hmm. well, so-and-so said, and he would start to just gut laugh <laughs> because he's like it's impossible and he went through the whole physiological response that would be it's like suspended animation but you'd have to have your cells would have to be living so if that were to happen the person that they're working on is not deceased okay yeah, yeah. there you go that's how right. that and i get that a lot too and especially like, yeah. that alone is a nightmare i mean yes. you wake up in that room <laughs> Oh that would be, that'd be one of my that worst nightmares. With, uh, with blood too, if they bleed, they're, they're probably alive, right? You usually you can tell too. You, like if there's a, 
if someone's been injured badly, uh, mm-hmm. like, let's say stab wounds or, or abrasions or something from a roadway, if there's no blood around them, you can kind of tell that's post-mortem. It's like coagulated. It, it's just post-mortem because the blood flow stopped. Your heart yeah. start pumping. Right. So, so you know, but how does like, um, I don't know if you know like forensics and things, but how do they know when a body is moved? Oh, there's lots of different ways like lividity. You know, uh-huh. for example, if you, uh, let's say a witness says, yep, I found him on the couch on his back. But then you observe the body in a different location. And let's say they're, the blood is pooled and settled you know, mm-hmm. uh, on the ventral side of the body rather than the dorsal side, you can tell that that doesn't match up. You said they were on their back. Then why isn't that blood right. sunk to the right? So in homicide investigations, now I'm going all CSI New York. Yeah. In a homicide investigation, I keep thinking I see somebody looking through I the keep window. Thinking I, I keep thinking I see somebody over there too. But Did I haven't that said just anything snap about a picture? It. No, it's, yeah. Well, no, I just, I mean, this is my funeral home, but it, I, it's someone snapping keeps pictures. It's snapping pictures of you. Somebody popped in there, and now the hair's standing up on my and neck. You're seeing, look. There it moved what? again. It's doing. It's it looks like we told you about it. <laughs> and I don't have a doll. And I just had to tell him about this. Yeah. You just so told me the doll, doll story. Yeah, and I just said that. Like we usually yeah. don't don't talk about that stuff because then stuff will start to happen. I literally just told him that camera was snapping. Right, because when he's when he was talking, was it that I kept I kept thinking I seen someone over there, but I always thought it was just that computer. <laughs> it's always been out of the corner of my eye, like a little bit of yeah. movement and a face kind of popping. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I, no, I told you I heard a woman earlier, dude. <laughs> I, I was, I was lying, was I? No, and then the then the hair stood up on the back of my neck, you know. Always, and I'm, that's usually a tell sign. I'm not a spooky guy. I mean, that, you yeah. know, it's just weird how that happens. Yeah, but. and then how he just saw that, and then that thing just that thing snapping pictures. And then snapping you guys pictures. bring it in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, I mean, I mean, like stuff like this happens. Like it, it doesn't like that. I don't get really bothered. Like that's no. what I mean. But I have a feeling like, though, you get creeped gotta... out. I mean, like, I know you're like the hairs on your arms will stand up and stuff, but like yeah. I'm not gonna like run out of here. You know what I mean? Oh no. It's got to be you. If that thing starts falling and this and that, I mean, that maybe, maybe I'll walk out. (laughs) No, I don't. Yeah, no, it doesn't bother me that way, but it's really funny. I never said a word and you never said a word to me either. Uh I just always was sensing some movement. Right. Back over there. there. Yeah. That room right there. Yeah. Like no. I didn't, I didn't say anything. I'm not. I I didn't say anything because I was kind of trying to debunk. I thought you would saw something too because I would peek over there every now and again. But you would also pee, peer over that way. Yeah. Let me. I'll tell you this really quick. Um, I didn't say anything because I was trying to kind of debunk it. But when we we're sitting here talking, this light is the one I see in there in the window. Yeah. It was like something walked in front of this. Like it, it blacked out for a second. On that wall. On that the the reflection. Of oh, your weird. light. So it would be like somebody walking this way, which is weird because there's n- obviously nobody right here, but it blacked out in the reflection like somebody walked by. Weird. Great. <laughs> yeah. It this, wouldn't be out there. It would be in here. Yeah. But this it's hasn't happened. This hasn't happened since Dolores' first time on the podcast. Like we've done podcasts. And, and it, was it that camera? Or was it this it camera? Was, this was camera. it this camera? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> Well, and then, then you know. Let me let me put a. I'm gonna put a new battery in there and see what. Okay, we want to re- reset them. Yeah, I'll reset. You're at 18 minutes now, anyway. So, see, it happened after we started talking about the creepy stuff. You know, right, what I mean? we just <laughs> we just got into uh, talking about like backroom stuff, and then. Yeah. <laughs> and then, as soon as he saw that, then that. Oh so my weird. goodness! Oh. I should have brought my whole kit. <laughs> see if you sit where I'm sitting and look, and you see this this light yeah. through the reflection. So you put your head right here. See oh, that light? See, yeah. Now imagine, like, if I went like this, watch. Hold on, I'll show you. So I would have to literally walk right here, right? Do it, do it again. If I walk right here. Yeah, right that. Did it black out? Yeah. So something would have had to walk like this for that to black out. But we were all sitting here. And it just happened on the wall, but it happened on me or not? No, it just happened on, on the reflection of the light. Like, it, it blacked out. Like, somebody went like across like this weird so obviously there was nobody here but you know, I gotta go in the reflection i saw it i gotta go that way now i got a pretty good battery <laughs> so that's what i mean like you talk about stuff like that <laughs> that's just odd that's how all that came happen. together just like, <laughs> yeah, like I mean. kind of weird all at the same time yeah at the same time because he and i never talked about that at all yeah. about that corner over there and like usually like i told him i said like we leave the mics hot 
because like sometimes when you're listening, sometimes you'll catch something. Yeah. So we usually leave them recording. But <laughs> I was telling him about that uh, that EVP we caught for Which the one? intro. The fall oh, versus fallen hour. Yeah. Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm like, what's up with that? Man, I told him, like, you got to put that in the intro, man. We didn't expect it. And then every now and again, did you reset them? Yeah. Just every now? now and again, we would record with that. And it, that, that same lady would come through. And then we ended up calling her Susan. Yeah. Susan. How did you pick Susan? Susan. Uh, who picked that name? Was it Alicia? Was it I think. I think so, yeah. Oh, um, Monsters versus Aliens. Oh, Susan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But yeah, that was like a notorious one that would always, I don't know, or start coming in. And there was like things going on upstairs that had to do with the lady. So it was kind of. So what is. Now you guys would drag that in here. (laughs) That's what everybody says. You know know what? We did this. um, So it's like, I I just told this guy, I had a theory that like you start talking about that stuff, he might start. Trying right. in, so I was telling like, yeah. don't talk about it. Right? <laughs> we had this um, thing happen where we went on like a little tour of going on and guest hosting on people's podcasts, and we every time we were done, they would either smudge their house or they would have some sort of yeah. creepy dream or something would happen after we wouldn't hang up. Yeah, we have a friend, and he uh, he even talked about on this one of his podcasts, and it's called Spirit Talkers. Oh, it was um, Unsolved Mysteries of the Reservation. Now it's Spirit Talkers. And he told, he, ta- he talked about on there, he said that he, he never records at night or anything like that. And we record late, you know, usually yeah. like really late at night. And Later he said, than well, this even. He said, uh, well, yeah, he said he like wanted the full experience and everything. So he recorded late with us. And that night got nuts, man. He said after, after we're done recording, he smudged his entire house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And everything, and he said he never recorded that night again. <laughs> After that, he never did. I was like, I don't know what it is, man. Every time we record with somebody, it's like something always happened with, with on their side. Believe me, I'm sitting here watching for the curtains to move <laughs> right now, I'm looking around. But. We haven't and, even talked about. And then with the so. uh, uh, ghost biker, she's a um, a paranormal investigator, and we recorded with her. And there was some weird stuff going on with that one too. Like, yeah, there's this painting that his dog always just barked at for some reason. Didn't like that picture. Yeah. And there was a scarf that was hanging off of it. And when we started, right, when we started talking and everything and started talking about everything, that scarf started, looked like somebody was pulling on it, going like this. Like wow. it was dancing. Yeah. It was dancing. We were both just sitting there staring at it. <laughs> yeah. too, bad, too bad we can't stay. <laughs> so out. on the video, you literally, like, oh, her name's Miranda Young. She asked us, like, what, what, you see something? What do you see? We were both just sitting there staring at the scarf going <laughs> Yeah, we had stuff <laughs> dancing around by itself. We had a shot glass flat of um, a dish strainer. It yeah. flipped out of the dish strainer before. We had my um, my light. We had we just recorded right after that too. Yeah, it was with the uh, um, um, somebody that does the ghost tours. Yeah, and his chandelier, literally my chandelier. Yeah, his chandelier was right over the table, and he has this um, artifact from Egypt, and it's a. Um, a, it's a I can't remember the name Shabet. of it. Shabet doll, and he had that on the table, and he had this. Um, it's called a, a SB11, mm-hmm. and it kind of it's a what do you call that? Um, oh my god, I can't think of the name. I lost it's, the name too now. When it yeah, goes through like all the different, yeah, yeah, it sweeps through all these different frequencies, and they can come through and talk to you on there. His wife had that. She was just walking around with it, eating a pizza, and a voice came through on there, and. She said, did you hear that? Like, and then another voice came through and it was a, the first one was a woman and the second one was a man. And jokingly, she said, I wasn't talking to you, you know, like, oh, I would like jokingly, but she probably offended whatever it was. Yeah. And this guy chandelier broke, like just broke right behind me and landed on that Chevette doll. Like right on that Shabet doll, and we all kind of like turned around to each other, like, "Did you guys?" Yeah, I was sitting there staring right at, and I was just, I was rolling these cords up, and just, <laughs> you know, I just saw that freaking ding. weird. Take quite a little energy to do that. Yeah, so, like you imagine, know. imagine just this glass just breaking. Yeah, that's that's what it was. That yeah. literally what happened. The glass yeah. just broke. Energy. And yeah, so and it's uh, always. We had, Stuff like that happens. And sometimes when stuff happens, Aaron Baker's always around and he gets so <laughs> creeped out. You know. He's always the one that sees it too. It was like lock size with whatever like falls or something. Or those door stoppers. You know those door stoppers that are like really bottom heavy? Yeah. He has a gnome that's a door stopper and he had it yeah. sitting up on a shelf 
and it was there for i don't know how long since yeah. he bought it we're recording and we're talking and that thing just tips like literally just stage dives off that yeah. thing and to really push that weird. thing over like you could have to really push it over for it to even fall so like how'd that thing just jumped off of there stuff like that Jeez, you yeah. guys yeah. <laughs> my hair is standing on it good thing is you can't tell yeah <laughs> Uh, <laughs> your uh, beard starts sticking yeah. straight out. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, but no, we Look, had some. Looks some like the captain beard. of the Titanic or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just afraid that kicking bird's going to be my new crow name down here now. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to call you that. That's yeah. going to be on his uh his little name thing on the, yeah. on the <laughs> video. Kicking bird. Your plaque. Kicking bird. <laughs> no, the, the video. A, <laughs> well, underneath this. one of my instructors at the academy, when I went through law enforcement academy, uh, that's, he called me that. He really? He say my name. So it was like, kicking bird. <laughs> you know what kicking I mean? Kicking bird. Re- report to the whatever, you know, and I'm like, yeah, it's Kirky Guard. And he's like, <laughs> Kicking bird. <laughs> how the hell? How did you say his name now? I can't. Kurgard. <laughs> Kurgard or something. Yeah, yeah Kurgard. Uh, I when, when I, or something like that. When I first heard, I saw his last name. I, I said in my head, Kirksgard. 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 And that's close. It's just yeah. the E. Kirkigard. Yeah. Long E. Kirkigard. You know, Kirkigard. That's it. Guard. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so if you look at at Scandinavian names. Anytime, and so actually, you'd see G, it ends in G A R D. It should be G A A R D. There's always two A's together. Hmm. My great grandfather just took it out for convenience because he was learning <laughs> English. Yeah. And so he's like, this is too long. Why he took one A out? So, <laughs> so technically, there are two A's in it. Weird. Um, but our, you know, yeah. our last name actually was. Yeah, a, they took some of it out. <laughs> and our takes last name is Takes the Horse. Is it take takes the horse from the enemy, yeah. right? That's our and then they took that. Oh, I've got a the the takes the horse family, which I'm pretty close to you guys and such. Mm-hmm. So you know, with Sam's deal, mm-hmm. there is so much to learn there with the reason for takes the horse and takes horse takes horse because yeah. you're related. Yeah, I mean it's the same family. I mean, but there's a reason for some of the the and some of the the being removed. Yeah, and I'm not sure what that is. And my dad was really like, "What is the reason like, for that? Do you know that?" He'd like always tell you it's takes the horse. Like he was really, yeah. you know what I mean, really adamant about yeah. it. Yeah, and he, would get, he would get mad at like uh, our aunties and stuff that use takes horse. And yeah, <laughs> it yeah. takes the horse. And yeah. <laughs> well, uh, just the other day now, um, and you can edit this out, but. Uh, with uh, with Pius, mm-hmm. his wife came to me and said, "Well, just so you know, he's a takes horse. He's not mm-hmm. a takes the horse." And I'm yeah. like, "But his dad is takes the horse. Yeah. You know what I mean?" And I, <laughs> yeah. so I was like, "Well, luckily it doesn't matter because it's on the death certificate and it doesn't show that part. Yeah. It doesn't show." But I was just like, "Gosh, if you're, I mean, you guys are takes the horse." Yeah. And then I'm like, "Well, Sam was a takes the horse." But then Sam's son, apparently his mother, thought it was too long and took the the out. That's what I found out. <laughs> huh. And, and, and yeah, I don't made it legally takes horse. I guess that's on his I don't understand that either. A lot of them use Just moved horse. again, by the way. But anyway. Yeah. That? Yeah, just moved over there again. In I wonder, the computer man, we got to like set oh, up wow. some, you got to set up some cameras yeah, in yeah, here. Yeah, you got to set up something. Yeah. Anyway, that's that. If you have one of those motion yeah. cameras, I bet you that sucker be kicking on. Next time we do this, I'm bringing. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna bring my equipment next time. Set it up back there or something. Yeah. Like a, so, static. is there anything else that you want to like hear about in the back? That was like the one thing that was really kind of. I've always wondered. What do you? Cause, what do you? Because I heard stories like that, and I mean, I remember hearing somebody say like somebody even kind of sat halfway up once. No. Yeah. They, but they do they do make noise though, they can There's make noise. There's air exchange. I mean, if you yeah. depends on what position your diaphragm's in. If you move people around, it's just a matter of physics. Air is gonna air is gonna move. I just hope on, the air is coming out this way. Yeah, they, uh, it is, and sometimes yeah. that's it's it'll alarm you a little bit, especially if there's any like like liquid, that kind of like that know, uh, exhale. Kind of, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a uh, kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. yeah, which to me now is like nothing. I mean, when I right. first started, I was like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that, <laughs> you know, but uh, like you just realize, yeah. like, uh, yeah. 
not. <laughs> no, it's more of just a, it's just more of an uh, air exchange like an air, happening, yeah. you know. But I'm surprised neither of you asked me about. Well, how do you embalm somebody? I thought, I always yeah, thought about. I thought that, that yeah. was going to come, but I, I was know, like, it I'll sounded just like leave it now. It sounded like <laughs> you know? just leave it now. He says I'll have to save it now for next time. Yeah. How how yeah. does that work? So. <clears throat> Thanks for asking, CD. Oh, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, normally, and this, I, people do ask me once mm-hmm. in a while, it's like, well, what does it mean? I don't yeah. think people know. I think they maybe think we put magic gloves on and just sprinkle powder or something like that. So, normally for me, if, if, um, I, I'm what, I'm what's known the way I was trained as a carotid embalmer. Mm-hmm. And some people are femoral embalmers, you know. Um, so, for me, when I say I'm a carotid embalmer, generally when I'm ready, you know, the, uh, set the features, the mouth is shut, the eyes are closed, uh, the body's been bathed and all of that. Now it's time to do the embalming, which mm-hmm. I, sh- you know, the embalming machine is, is basically your heart, if you want to think about it that way. So the first thing you do is I make a little incision right, uh, right on the collarbone here, a little mm-hmm. scalpel, you know, just, and then um, I have a couple of instruments go in and... Um, Gosh, I remember back when I was young trying to find these blood vessels in amongst all this tissue and fashion mm-hmm. and all of this. And I'm like, I'm never going to get it. <laughs> I'm just never going to get it. I can't yeah. find it. And and then if I did find it, that like your veins are a lot weaker than like your arteries are pretty strong. So if you'd find a vein, because that's what you drain blood out of is the yeah. vein. Oh, wow. And you introduce embalming fluid into the do you artery. Do, the, do you do the draining too? Mm-hmm. Like the blood? Mm-hmm. And then embalm? It happens simultaneously. Oh, okay. Oh, so, wow. so you, you find this vein and you, you bring it to the surface and you put ligature on either end. And then you, when it comes to the carotid, the artery is medial, which means more towards the middle, and deep. Whereas you'd say the, the, the jugular vein is lateral and superficial. Mm-hmm. You know, but so, so then once the artery is found and it's deeper and, you know, some people that are big people, it's hard to, f- it takes quite a while because there's a lot to find and go through down here. And then you bring that up, then you just make a little incision in it. And the, it's called a cannula on the end of the embalming line. And you, you handle the pressure and the rate of flow per minute. And you've got your, what I talked to you about earlier is you, we all have our different mixtures that we think is going to do the adequate embalming that we want to do. Mm-hmm. And then that cannula goes in the artery. It's clamped with a hemostat or forcep. And you begin the process. Now, the fun part comes when someone's got a clog somewhere or mm-hmm. something's broken somewhere. So all of a sudden, the leg is not Taking. You'd like to, You'd like to be able to do the whole embalming through just this one point. And so, you know, a lot of times we do what's called muscle massage as we're doing that to help force the blood up because I've also made a little snip in that jugular vein and I put what I use as a vein expander to go down it and uh, to to help the blood come out. Blood is your enemy because it has water in it too and that's where Mm. bacteria starts. But so in other words, sometimes not all areas embalm equally off one point. So Mm. it's, I've, I've done what we call six point injections where I've done both femoral arteries, both brachials, both carotids, and sometimes both but they radials. Usually, they usually wow. all connect, so you can just sit there and what do you just if wait? It, if someone has a good vascular system, a lot of times just that one point will do it, but other times the legs won't be getting embalmed. And you'll know because of the color. There's dye in all of the mm-hmm. embalming chemicals. And what then color it is it? Firmness. Um, it just, some of them have more, uh, orange hues and some have more pink hues. Tell them the name of that one you showed me that, that purple one. Yeah. It's called Intrafiant. Intrafiant. It's, uh, yeah, it'll generally clear out a room after really? a while because it's very strong. Like that it's, bad? It's made for, for bodies that are, are uh, you know, maybe starting the decomposition process or you're trying to save them oh, wow, to okay. get them embalmed and get them in there. Yeah, it's got a it's got a unique nickname, but I, I don't probably have to edit that out. But but it's used it's it's used as a like you'll a, tell you the nickname after the last <laughs> straw. You know what I mean? But yeah. yeah, we do that. So that's basically how it works. But so it's a surgical procedure, but it's also an artist's procedure because you want the the way we set features, the way we close eyes, the way sometimes we'll inject uh, hypodermically to. Like if someone's really sunk in, we'll fill their face back out and oh, okay. do different things like that. And there's all kinds of different chemicals. How long does it usually take to embalm? 
if it goes really well, like I, you know, if I can make everything work through this one injection site and one drainage site, um, two hours. Wow. Wow. That's you know, not going to be a lot if I'm, longer than if that. If I'm back there and it's, and someone's really fighting me and I'm having to, to do multiple injection sites, I would say probably it just depends three hours and then an autopsy repair, which is very invasive. I mm -hmm. you know, people, thankfully people don't really get a chance to see that the public doesn't get to see what an right. autopsy looks like when yeah. it comes back that repair can be if i do it by myself um that can be a, a four-hour wow. procedure yeah, too assuming everything goes good you know but yeah wow. uh, autopsy is not for the faint of heart that's for sure mm -hmm. i would never <clears throat> generally allow anyone to to pop in to see an autopsy repair it's it's yeah. pretty invasive so yeah, and it and a lot of the ways it is it is it it is like an art form because I mean you yeah. see uh, the repairs you do and it's like when we when we saw Dad I was like man he look, he looks just like he like yeah. he's sleeping or something <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean but it's like it is an art form to it and I think it's something to admire. I think I think it I think the individual uh, embalmer, if you will, um, it it really comes down to how much they enjoy the. That sounds really bad. Like I enjoy him both. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, you get, it's, it's something that is important because it's the yeah. last gift you can give the family. Yeah. Right. You know, if, if you came to me and say, Hey, my loved one looks great. He looks peaceful. He's, he looks just great. That's the really last gift I can give you. Yeah. You know what I mean? To say, Oh my gosh. Now, you know, the other yeah. way, but, but there are embalmers out there that, you know, grumpy cigarette hanging out like well i'm yeah. gonna run a tank of fluid through them if it goes it goes if it don't it don't and then you have trouble you know what i mean yeah i mean i've been i've been to a funeral before like i'm not gonna say where <laughs> right but i remember even like they're like god it, she looks horrible <laughs> you know I mean? yeah so, like does not look like them at all and just and sometimes yeah. that's not always on the funeral home there mm. there's other th things you know accidents that has, and, comes into play with that i mean if it was like a yeah. natural death yeah, it just depends, you know, like we've had several that have come out of the hospital um, and basically they, you could tell they'd begun the dying process mm -hmm. many, many days before before the the end date occurred. Yeah. And so I, there's there's been uh, cases even here where uh, basically I would say topical and, and even deeper um, decomposition has started while they're living because the body is pulling everything inward, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And so everything on the outside is literally starting to decay. Yeah. And that's just kind of sad. And usually yeah. it's, a, you know, a lot of times it's liver, kidney, if there's extra nitrogen in the blood, in mm -hmm. the bloodstream and in the body, nitrogen and, and formaldehyde have, have a hate, hate relationship. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, long-term kidney disease is often, difficult to deal with we do and then thankfully the chemicals are so good now we can make it work a lot better than they used to so wow anything else over there marcus in the back rooms he pretty much answered everything i i, <laughs> I wanted to know back there so i think that pretty much yeah. answers it too for me the other one Can't i really... have the last one i have is how people shut the mouth oh right it's like how yeah. do you shut them i mouth? never isn't like, it like really a weird um gun thing or that's one way really yeah that's one way that. it's called a needle injector and it's just a pin mm -hmm. so one pin is driven into the maxilla and one into the mandible and then the mouth is held oh. shut and they have wires and you twist them tight and then cut the wire and set the, the lips the way they should be set and that's how you close the mouth oh, i do wow. not use that method i use a surgical method i either use a um, mandibular suture or a musculature suture i just do that with a needle and ligature and so um it just it involves going down through um on the outside of the jawbone yeah and then back up through the same hole but on the back side then and come up go up through here up through the nose across down down and then i tie it shut whoa because wow. it won't it won't ever pop loose then that's how i do that wow where did you learn that in school, in mortuary school. Does the yeah. other method like pop loose a lot? Is that it why? can or? because some, especially people with really poor bone density mm. or or that have had, um, 
a lot of dental issues and things like that. That that bone is 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 obviously not very strong in like right. the real elderly. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff you don't want to happen like during a funeral or anything like that like well hopefully they're firm enough after embalming it wouldn't happen but i just prefer that way because i know then once i've closed I it it's imagine, closed you know? i could just imagine that <laughs> happening like you're trying to like <laughs> i was like dumb like things pop in my head like no one's somebody getting... try to cry over them and just, <laughs> and just no one's just getting... watch everybody just <laughs> yeah. straight back no one's getting orbited <laughs> those are the questions i get the most is like what is embalming and how do you close their mouth and that's it's just always interesting. Yeah, and it's 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 minor. So what if surgical? You know, what if somebody got that like elaborate? But, like, with what if somebody's too long for a casket? Have you had that happen? Like, what would you do? I've had it happen. How will you do then? It, it depends on when you say too long. It really does matter how tall is tall. Like, right. So we had a guy not here, but uh, another funeral. He was six foot ten. Wow, that's a big dude. That yeah, is a big that dude. That is big. So that was a special order, honestly. But in most cases, your guys that are six, up to, I'd say up to six five, six six are pretty easy. I'll try to bend their knees just a little bit. Mm -hmm. So <clears> even <throat> while I'm embalming them, so that'll fix in the, that position. So their feet are like raised up. A yeah, little we just bit, got their knees drawn knees up. up just a little bit, and then you know once that foot end of the lid is down, you don't see that. You, know, you don't you don't really see that elevation, and then then there's room to do it. And he was telling me that you have some families that want to see that, and they'll when you leave the room, they'll open the the casket, the rest of and the take a look, take like, a look, or you have people crawl into the casket too. And I haven't like had that. that for a long time. Um, I had one woman that was so distraught, um, or perhaps I don't know, uh, medicated. But she she was literally in the cast in the cast in we had to pull her out not not because I mean there was well I mean it, it's not really considered acceptable to do that as protocol yeah but but we did have to get her out only because it became unstable on the on the on the church truck that yeah. the casket and we you don't want a casket to fall off with someone in it so that's no. why. But yeah, no, she was in or, or mostly in. Yeah. Wow, that's not that weird. It's like. <laughs> It's you hear stories like that, and it's like it's there's just some weird like, things that my happen wife around. better be that dramatic. When I <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's crazy. Like just thinking about like all that stuff that happens. Like, I, have you ever thought about that? Like, how do you? How would you want your funeral to go? Like, how would kind like of that. casket? I want it to have <laughs> be dramatic. Yeah, everyone's got to be wasted or something. <laughs> no, that was Gordon Ramsay's thing. <laughs> yeah, so Lots of doing? boy George music in the room. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, all I told Alethea was, that I, I want you guys to pay like ten random women to come and just cry at my casket. <laughs> 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 oh, shoot. I told her I only want because she wants to be cremated, Alethea. Mm. I said I just want the casket and stuff because I just want the clothes. What? I want to look nice. You just want the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! It'll be all black, do. everything yeah. for sure. Though, and some rock yeah. music going. I got that yeah. new black casket back. I know too. that was cool. You really, it's that, jet yeah. black. I yeah. gotta see that. It's got yeah. silver, silver handles around it. I mean, if you're if you're a Harley guy or an Oakland Raiders guy, I'm or, a Harley guy. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's it. Because then if nice. you could put a graphic on that or something, yeah. a Harley graphic. That that'd yeah, be it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. That'd be, uh, <laughs> not trying to move you on your way or anything. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying it's really cool. You just put that to the you side. Know? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I can get him. Again, there it goes again. But yeah. Anyway, did you hear that? I did. Like that high pitch. Yeah, heard it again. Yeah. What time is that? We'll we'll know by the. It's one fifty seven. So I got to look for that. Like, I'm just thinking about this, like, crack open right here, right behind me. <laughs> Have a face pop up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, we were, I mean, this is a Fallen Hour podcast, so we got to stick to the theme a little bit. Yeah. And we got to get spooky sometime. Right, we got to yeah. get a little spooky here. Do you have... I mean, it already started earlier. <laughs> oh, gosh, I know. So, like, what is your relationship with the paranormal? Well... Other than just being a casual fan, you know, I mean, my wife and I have watched... 
I think we watched Ghost Hunters. And do you remember when when that first really came came to fruition and became like a thing, a thing, the travel yeah. channel and and so on and so forth. It really became, you know, I think it, for us it started with. I think we watched Ghost Hunters. I think the original Ghost Hunters crew. And then and then Baggins and Ghost, yeah, Adventures, Ghost Adventures got really yeah, we big. We started out with Ghost Hunters and Taps and all that stuff yeah. too. Yeah, Taps, that yeah. was yeah. Ghost Hunters, yeah. yeah. And then lately it's just it's just now it's more of a it's more entertainment, you yeah. know, because destination fear, you know, because we're at that stage of our lives where oh, look at those cute kids out there hunting ghosts, you know yeah. what I mean and whatever, but um I wouldn't, you know, I come from a really faith-based family, you know, mm-hmm. raised in the church and very, you know, um, my, I told CDL earlier, my grandfather on my, my paternal grandfather was like a no-nonsense, rugged kind of bronc rider, cowboy. Yeah. And if you'd have said, Grandpa, I think I saw a shadow cross from the barn to the house or something, he'd be like... Move on, boy, or I'll kick you right in the butt. Or, you know what I mean? He, he would have said, "There's no way that's real." You know, yeah. that's that's crazy. That's got to be a sound bite right there. Yeah, <laughs> move on, boy. <laughs> move on, boy. And he didn't talk like that either. But I'm gonna start saying that when we hear something. Yeah, move on, boy. Yeah, but but you know, I when I really started by funeral career, I started Malta and that was the same building that when I was a sheriff's deputy up there 20 years before that, you know, in a small town, um, I was a coroner. I was, I, I went to coroner school and it was the end of 1993 or early 1994 that I, so I've been a coroner for most of that stretch, you know, which is we're 30 years mm-hmm. and, you know, so, um, but that was the same funeral home when I was a sheriff's deputy in a small town. You always go to the local funeral home, off like they do here. You know, the coroner needs a place to, to examine, to store, to, to do a toxicology draw, which I do a lot of that for the coroner, draw toxicology or assist in doing that. And so oddly enough, I full circled, and that's where I ended up getting into the, to the mortuary uh, business, partly because my mother-in-law had just passed away. And I had known the funeral director from or the owner from my sheriff's days, and uh, was had remained friendly with him, and he'd taken care of both of my my in laws at that funeral home, and and I actually sat and talked with him for a while, and I said, hey, you know, I don't think I'm too old. I think I can do it. I think I can go back to school and do all of that and get another degree, and I I'm, I think I'm up for it. I think I'd be good at it. Mm-hmm. So I kind of started with him as an apprentice up there. And uh, usually we associate like hauntings. And I don't know if I'd call what happened to me a haunting or Mm -hmm. an event. An Uh, encounter? An encounter, maybe. A haunting seems more like a residual thing to me. It happens at the same time every night or in the same window or at the the same thing rattles or whatever. Like reoccurring. Kind of a reoccurring thing, like it's an imprint. Um, so anyway, I was working up there and this building was built in I 78, maybe, um, something like that. And I feel bad cause the, it's got a new owner up there now. So hopefully he doesn't catch all of this, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of a cinder block building. It's a one level cinder block building, very nice building set out for a funeral home. And even the interior walls are cinder block, gray oh, wow. cinder block. It's nice. I mean, there's night portraits and big chapel and all that. So from the very front of the building, you can just like this, just like this hallway here, except it's yeah. a hallway, not an aisle way. Mm-hmm. Goes all the way from the front of the of the funeral home to the back to the garage. There's two. <coughs> there's two visitation rooms you pass. There's a family room you pass, and then you get to an office, a bathroom, prep room, garage, where the crematory was in the garage too. So I'm working there as an apprentice, and it's more. It starts more as a kind of like what just happened kind yeah. of to, like you sent something but you, yeah. you're like nah i mean and and i was telling oh, that's a pain in mind knew it yeah i was telling marcus earlier too i'm 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 scientific enough i have two science degrees so to me there is there are people that can let their mind run away with them too yeah you know that you have to differentiate you have to you have to discriminate between is this out of the ordinary or is it just me 
feeling like it's out of the ordinary <laughs> yeah. and accentuating yeah. the fear. Because your mind can fill in the void yeah. or fill in spaces and you know what I mean? So the first thing that happened at that funeral was, and I think I told Marcus this while you were out, we'd walk from the back to the front often, you know, but we'd always leave this family section dark that you'd walk through. You'd straight line, but you'd, you'd walk through a section. And there was always something in the corner. That's all I could tell you. Yeah. And I mean, I, I didn't sit there and get my tablet out, uh, you know, and say, I believe I'd like to study this. For me, it was uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. enough that the pace kind of went like picked up a little bit. Yeah. But there was always a sense that there was something darker. Like your vision, you ever been in a in a room and it's dark to the point you're stopped because you don't want to stumble around and hit everything and yeah. you sense something darker than the dark? Yeah. 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 So that's what this was. It was a, uh, I don't know, I, I guess for lack of a better term, I'd call it a figure. And it was crouched. And I told you gargoyle. Yeah, and and I don't, like I, I'm gargoyle. not saying it was a gargoyle, but that's the only thing my mind could, because it seemed to be crouched and had was sitting like this, you know, <laughs> in the dark. And it was darker than the dark. And so I'm in the building by myself, kind of new to the funeral business. And, I, and I'm like, I don't think I like that a lot. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so after that, I find out these stories because the old funeral director there was like, Bleh. he was like yeah. my, my grandfather, you know, <laughs> yeah. the same guy, yeah, same yeah. guy, you it's the know? same guy, it's the same <laughs> voice. And he's like, you know, there ain't ever been anything in here, you know? And I, so later on he comes forward and says, well, I can't imitate him anymore. I'll cough. <laughs> but, but he says, well, no, the previous owner who, who built the building and him both heard this, all the time when they'd walk by a viewing room and then that same family room, yeah. same whistle. Weird. Now I've heard that whistle at my funeral home in Lewistown too. Just Weird. like trying to get your attention. So in two different places? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You heard the same whistle. Same whistle. Same whistle. Huh. Yeah. Same whistle. So why do you have something on that and whistles? That sounds like someone's following him. Well, yeah. Oh, it, there, there's no doubt. That, like, I don't think, you know, I, I think that's true. I yeah. mean, I think it's true. But here, here, I'll tie all this in for you right now. So we've got the whole whistle thing. Yeah. Now, on, I didn't really hear the whistle, but maybe once or twice. And again, by that point, I was like, mm, maybe I've convinced myself I've heard a whistle. But no, I, it's a whistle. So remember my little gargoyle dude, darker yeah. than dark, whatever that was. This long hallway, I'm walking from the back office, the garage area, to the front office where people would come in the door. And I remember it was, it was the middle of the morning. It wasn't at night. It wasn't late. It wasn't anything. And I'm walking down the hallway to the front in this cinder block wall. And I hear footsteps behind me. Now, I know I'm in the building alone, and I know that I would have heard a door. Like a door, they're big yeah. metal doors, like clunk, bang. So I'm, I'm walking down the hall, and I'm getting the hair on yeah. the neck, standing up, and very cold. And I'm like, I really don't want to turn around. I'm like, you know, Shazam, let's keep going, <laughs> you know. And the footsteps start to increase their pace. And they're coming from behind me, which, you know, it's, like it's, it's catching up. It's a good 50 yards. Yeah, it's, it was walking. Now it's starting to, oh. and then it keeps getting more and more. And then I hear the only thing I could relate it to would be the fingernails going down that as it's running up behind me. That's so creepy. It, it was like fingernails going down the cinder block. And I finally, I had, I was, I guess, man enough. I had to turn around because I wasn't going to let it whatever was coming hit me from behind yeah. and I spun around and there's just nothing there. <laughs> the ru the running quit, the fingernails quit. I spun around from me to you. There's nothing there. And there was oh nowhere gosh. for anyone to go. There's nowhere for it. It's a one long hallway. Wow. So after that, I finally caught the owner who was very dismissive of any haunting or whatever you want to call it. Presence. He, uh, uh, a body had been delivered to us to, to prepare that night from a funeral home he was helping up there. And so that gentleman brought the body over, and the three of us, it's about 9 o'clock at night, 
when this body arrives and we're getting ready to embalm this, you know, embalm this body for that funeral home. And uh, there's a big crash of the door. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and we're like, oh, crap, Our, the door to the prep room is open. Uh -huh. So I know the front's locked because I locked that at 5 o'clock. There's no yeah. reason to have the front door open at the funeral home. Hey, what are you doing? Something similar to that. No, it's not the front door. No, it's not the garage doors. There's no other doors to get in there because those auto lock. I mean, so obviously you don't want people just to be able to walk yeah. in. So those mm -hmm. doors out there auto lock. So we thought, crud, someone's in the building. And we, uh, we walked into the garage, down the hall. Everything's locked. No, no one's in there. No mm -hmm. one... Not his wife, not anyone would have access into the building. And we heard that just as loud as day. The door crash, and it was the garage door, the inner garage door. And we went diving to shut the door because we thought, oh, no, we don't want someone to see this, you know, this body on a stretcher. Yeah. And it was, there was nothing there. And so <laughs> it's just weird. That's it's so just, weird. That it's weird. weird. But but the running up behind yeah. me with the claws and the and the pace quickening was probably scarier than anything. I had that happen to me once yeah. too. Like it something was following sounded like it was following me. And I remember I ran across this bridge and when I stopped I could hear it catch up like that's, right behind me. That's exactly and what yeah, it did. That's that happened Just to me. And that increased. was at three in the morning and there was nobody out. So <laughs> if you imagine that. We yeah. had we had some happen though with whistling too. Yeah, we did actually and I was gonna say like you're like that when you did that whistle mm -hmm. imitate that whistle they always say don't whistle at night <laughs> you ever hear that <laughs> uh no i haven't mark <laughs> no and i haven't just did it's like, yeah, like, it's like, it's like a, yeah. you might call something yeah. is what they I, I, I know i know there yeah. was a story like yeah what he's talking what he's probably getting to is we were outside our parents house and we used to live on cody here in yeah. town and we talked about there we, we thought we heard something and my uh my brother whistled and my cousin Roman was sitting there with us and he told him, don't, don't do that. You know, you're not supposed to whistle at night. And he uh. said, why is it? Cause you're going to call, you might call spirits or something. So that's how they used to call spirits. And he kind of mentioned that. And my brother did it again, you know, did this certain whistle and the way he did the whistle, we heard it, something whistle back and we sat there or like looking down the road and then it did the whistle again and then it whistled in the other direction and it sounded like it was far away right so like he didn't whistle that loud so this thing sounded like it was way a ways away whistling really loud then it was the other direction then back this way then the whistle started getting closer my goodness and it got to the point where we were like we heard the whistle come from um the right of us and we seen something peek out behind a tree and then go back and then whistled again. Mm -hmm. And this time we saw something across the street behind something <clears throat> else peek out. Like it was getting closer, but it was like it'd peek out here, then it would peek out there, and then it would peek out behind something closer to the point where it was behind a, pole. Um, a light pole. And the light pole is only what, about 10 inches wide? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. And I mean, I can't hide behind that thing. Right. <laughs> you can't hide behind much things. <laughs> <laughs> I set myself up for that one. Yeah. But it literally, like, we were still facing that direction, and yeah. that pole was only this wide, and we seen something, you know, like this, and lean back. And we'd hear the whistle again, except the whistle came across the street. In the apartment complex across the street, something started peeking out. Behind that, like it was making its way toward us. How old were you when this was? We were, we were. <clears throat> I was of drinking age. <laughs> yeah, I'll say so I was like, drinking then? I was like, I was like twenty-one, I think. Oh, yeah. um, but I wasn't. We weren't drinking. The grossest like that. thing we that happened, outside happened to me at that that place was that clown that we seen, and this is the <laughs> weirdest story in the world. Don't know why. Don't know how. But we're. It's like. Halloween's a big deal to us, like in our family, like um, my sister and we all love Halloween. So, yeah, the, it was weird though because we, you guys had Dolores in the car or something with you or something like that. She was on the road somewhere, but she's oh, at the clown incident. Yeah, she's yeah. deathly afraid of clowns. So, um, and 
we were waiting for the strike of midnight just to say it's Halloween, whatever, whatever. Me and Al were standing outside and he was smoking and I was out there with him. And it was around that time, 11 something, close to midnight. And the only light on our street was at the end. And it lit up the corner of this house and the sidewalk. And we're out there and we just kind of got quiet a little bit. We're looking around. And for some reason, this clown comes riding down the, the road. <laughs> and he's got these huge shoes on. <laughs> he's got like, like ridiculous, this ridiculously yeah, big clown shoes. It's like, right? why? And he's got this big old like yellow yellow suit on. It's got like polka dots on it. And he's got this huge hat, like a cowboy hat. And he's riding a like unicycle. Like a 10 gallon hat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> massive. And he's riding a unicycle. Down Cody. Yeah. Down yeah. Cody. On and a he, unicycle. And he jumps off the curb. We don't hear him at all. He just jumps off and then keeps riding. And me and Adam are like, looking at it, like, did you see that? <laughs> and he's like, see, so he, he's looking for his keys. We get in the car. We take off around that corner to find him. Can't find him. Like how far can he get on a unicycle? Yeah. That fast. With that hat. With that right. balance. <laughs> and it was like around midnight. It was, it oh, was the weirdest man. thing. That is weird. Yeah. Like, I, I tell him, like, clowns are funny, but not at night. <laughs> you uh-huh. know what I mean? <laughs> that is just unsettling. Yeah, we, I called Dolores right away and told her, and she freaked out. <laughs> my sister is, ab- my youngest sister is absolutely terrified of clowns. <laughs> Which gives me a good impetus every Halloween to like pop up in her kitchen in a clown <laughs> uniform, you know. Like I so, like I like like yeah. Pennywise, yeah. like you know that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm probably wearing. Yep, I got Pennywise socks on right now. Like I'm a but fan of that stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, but yeah, she's she hates it. She hates them. So that just creeped her the hell out. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, we could probably get Steve to his dinner. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. What else? What else you got? That's about. I think that's about it. That's about it. About wrapping yeah. it up. Yeah. Do you have any more stories about paranormal or anything? I kind of do, but uh, you know, one, one of them is uh, one of them happened at the the next funeral home that I had, and the only reason I don't tell it to a lot of people is because I can't definitively prove because I'm there alone. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's hard when you don't have a witness. It's yeah. just you. And then I'm telling you, like, hey, you know what happened to me? And you're like, ah, oh, yeah, right. Because yeah. I can say whatever I want. This is a safe place. <laughs> no, no, but there was... <laughs> we get stories like this all the time. But, yeah. I mean, there was no witnesses. So, I mean, I don't yeah. have any corroboration mm-hmm. or anything. But I'm convinced that... So, I, I felt there was an apartment above the funeral. That's where I lived. Yeah. It wasn't an, an apartment right above the funeral home. Mm. So, and I wasn't, I wasn't used to hearing bangs in the night or anything it wasn't like that at all were you already in the funeral industry yeah by oh then? yeah i had the funeral home i'd worked i'd been working there as a trade guy first before i mm-hmm. bought it and uh so anytime i was there i stayed upstairs in that apartment and mm-hmm. it was a nice apartment i was old it was dated mm-hmm. but it was it was like a 1900 square foot apartment up there it was a big wow. place you know um but i'd always i'd always sensed that doesn't make noises like that what was that then? I don't know. It's like a click. It sounded like a. It almost sounded like that. That like how it sounds when it takes a picture. Yeah, but it's off. You can check that if you want. No, I. I believe you. That was weird. But it. it, 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 it the, there was just that sense that was something. And then I started to see. So, so the way this was laid out, it was almost they almost ran that place like an old speakeasy back in the fifties. It used to be a movie theater. Oh, wow. The funeral home used to be a movie theater. Then it was converted to a funeral home, but it started to be shadows. I would hear like creaks and stuff, and I'm like, "Calm down, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just an old whatever." It's an old house or an old building. I'm not worried about it. But then there was always this real, real sense of something moving around me and moving outside the hall and peeking. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, mm-hmm. and peeking in and peeking out. And so I'm like, nah, it's nothing. This went on for quite a while to the point I started to get sleep deprived because it was bothering me enough that I thought, you know, I kind of have one eye open most of the time just because A, I want to see something and B, is it real? But um, wow. so one night I'm laying in bed and I remember it. That's the other part. I mean, I remember this clear as a bell. Laying in bed and... I look over at the clock, and I kid you not, 3 o'clock a.m. 
Oh, man. The old witching hour, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, it said 300. And I turn back, and all of a sudden, I can just feel it. I'm Something just moved. I am stuck um, in the back corner now. I am stuck um, laying on my back. Mm. I can't move. And I can feel this pressure coming up here, and now I can't breathe. Oh, man. And it's... It's ch- it's choking me, and I, it was for 15 minutes. I couldn't I couldn't do anything. I was paralyzed. If there'd have been a fire, uh, anything, I would not have moved. And someone said, "Well, you had sleep paralysis." I'm like, yeah. "No, I did not yeah. have sleep paralysis because I was wide awake. I was there was no yeah, reason you weren't for like it. half asleep, half awake, you right? Were wide no, awake. no, wide awake. And I was like, "This is unreal." And then I, I kept getting to the point that I was. I kept trying, you know how you try to raise your head out of the water? Yeah. Like if you're, you know, and that's how I felt. And I kept trying to raise my, it panicked me. Finally, yeah. finally went on for about uh, like 12 to 13 minutes. That's an eternity. It's an like, eternity. Uh, and I, I was just barely breathing. I was fighting to breathe. And I remember thoughts going through my head of, am I having a stroke? Am I having a mm-hmm. heart attack? Am I having something? And I'm like, it was none of that. Because once this passed, you could feel... I don't know how to explain it. You could just feel it's almost like it Mm -hmm. came to prove a point. Okay. You're in my place. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that I'm your boss or whatever. I'm just, I'm just guessing. I don't know. But, um, but it went on for a good 12 minutes. And, and after that, um, I had a much deeper respect for it, but, but the activity, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it ceased, but it, it, after that one event, it almost went to nil. So, I mean, that's what makes me think it's right. real is because of all the little things leading up to yeah. the creeks, the bangs, the peeking in. the like It was progressing. Yeah, like I felt it getting closer. Wow. Every night it was yeah. getting closer. And then that night at 3 a.m. it decided to. So then you can have other discussions was... Was it a ghost? Was it demonic? What was it? You know yeah, what I yeah. mean? And I don't like the D word at all. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I don't like <laughs> anywhere near like, there. Like even you know, Aaron, but, like Wheezy, the one that has, yeah. that's always on the podcast, he, he tells he's that terrifies him. Yeah. yeah. Like it does. That's one thing he does not yeah. like. Yeah. Like. So that's it. I mean, that's really no, it. Those are good ones, but yeah. Yeah. It's almost like it was trying to get comfortable with him or, you know what I mean? Or trying to like. See, Make his presence known. Or trying to probably like see what he's going to react to. Like, does this scare him or. Like it's kind of peeking out looking at you and then I think, the middle of your sleep is like yeah i, I think <laughs> and not i think it yet yeah i think <laughs> maybe finally, this will work got you <laughs> finally he wanted me to know who was boss you know yeah the next night he was like yeah it didn't work i'll have to try it oh, again man. you know but like that one really creeps me like the, the thought of it like a picture of like the one you told earlier about like something being in the dark and you just see it crouching. Like, yeah. that made me think that thing was like trying to hide and watch you. Like, it was. you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's just, the impression I got was like, it's just, like how, uh, yeah, the, like a, but they, they more s- animalistic yeah. the way you kind of describe it. But they say it. that when, when it's, when they show, when they show themselves, they want you to see them. Yeah. That just gave me the chills. What? Yeah. I just thought, I thought I saw something right there. I keep thinking I see like, something. Like, I, I literally felt there. it. Like, and then I the felt last, it. the last one when I pointed when you were yeah. shooting was back in that corner by the double door. It's so weird. It's always like, I don't know. It's always like, I always feel like there's something like, like right, right there. Here. Yeah. Like that's where all like night right there. since yeah. we started almost. Yeah. Like when I turned, it was like right where that light is, that opening right mm-hmm. there on this side in the computer room. Yes, it exactly. Like right that's right there. Where I've been. That's where I just saw yeah. something. I, yeah, that's where it's been yeah. all night. And I just felt like chills go like shooting down like really quick. So we got to. Oh, like I saw that. <laughs> next time we got to bring our stuff and just. Because we have stuff that we can set up and that just sits there and then passive, yeah. yeah. And if something mm-hmm. passes in front of it or some or yeah. a change in temperature, it'll it'll tell change us. Change in temperature or static electricity, that kind of stuff. Gotta um, get a spirit box in it. Um, yeah, we do. Yeah, Rem yeah. SB eleven. Yeah, we got it. We don't that have a Rem has, pod. Um, the SB eleven. Actually, does it? It rate or reads a drop in temperature. Oh, wait, no, we do or rise have a REM. In temperature. Yeah, we do have a REM pod. Yep. Mm. Uh, rise in temperature, drop in temperature. It'll sound the uh, sound an alarm. When that happens, and it has a spirit box built into it. Is the spirit box the one that goes through all the frequencies? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of sweeps. Yeah. And then you can catch 
Yeah. It puts the syllables together, the words yeah. together. Yeah, and we we have one that that one is actually audible, like actually hear their voices. Yeah, and we can run a so multiple. That's what that is. We can run on multiple channels with that one. It, it's and got, what's that one you have with the where it reads the the meter is the, the um, EVP? No, uh, no. Mel meter. Something like that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A yeah. 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 Have that too, and a couple other things. So. Do that. Yeah, those. We have, we ended up having nights where those started getting triggered once we start talking. And well, there's definitely more than I expected here tonight. Yeah, it's like always it's with a, the podcast. So it's, it's like, like we, once you Mark, get into that conversation, it's like it starts. Kinda, like Marcus can come to the house and we'll do just nothing, and nothing happens. As soon as we like start setting up the cameras and stuff and start rolling, then that's when we start getting like activity. It's strange. Yeah, <laughs> it's it is. It it's because we kind of like almost like a pre convo of what's going on. Yeah. We, like that conversation i think it. it starts kind of drawing that out well we are this has been an interesting topic and i'm really happy you sat down with us because yeah, yeah it's too, like because yeah. you kind of feel like sometimes the funeral industry or funeral directors or owners they kind of keep things kind of hush yeah but that's what it all like kind of felt like i think right but i think it's something for i mean especially for somebody who's been through um the mourning process is you kind of want to hear these things. It's almost like a, a closure in some way of knowing these behind the scenes kind of yeah. things that go on inside of a funeral home. I agree. It's uh, we're, we're meant to be an advocate. Right. And like I said, a real positive uh, kind of push in the back to, mm -hmm. in some sense, but also we're um, nothing should, nothing should and nothing does, but nothing should mean more to us than the care of your loved one and then the care of your family in support of that. And that's exactly how we do it. And I right. mean, that that's, that's our goal every time. And so that's what we strive for. So, mm -hmm. and we are launching a podcast with Steve in the, the funeral home and it's going to be, I think we're going with behind the veil for we the name. behind the veil podcast. That'll be out uh, sometime soon. And it's going to be someone like this. So we're going to be, talking about the funeral industry, some things behind the scenes that you wouldn't uh, normally hear, maybe some interviews along the way. Mm -hmm. Marcus will be a co-host on this and be something interesting to go forward. I and, think we'll uh, get some emails to come in too. We'll answer questions or yeah, however you get yeah, questions to questions, us. Yeah. You know, that yeah. would be real cool. To I was like doing that kind of stuff. Kind so, of yeah. viewer mail, so to speak. Yeah. You know? So yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be a really, I think it's really cool something to get into. So yeah. Look out for that. It'll be announced on our announced on our Facebook. So with that being said, Marcus, <laughs> my name is Sid Alinek. This is Marcus, and tonight our special guest, Stephen. I said Stephen. I didn't say Stephen. Kirk Guard. Kirk. He <laughs> got it. He <laughs> passed. He gets a gold star. <laughs> You're listening to Fallen Hour Radio. I almost said Ermagerd. <laughs> yeah, dude. I saw it like literally right there. So weird. That is the best time I've had in a long time sitting <laughs> down with you two just shooting the bull. Got to do yeah. it more. I, it's, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's fun.